are recording. Michael, Rob, are you guys ready? Ready. I'm re ready. Yeah. Ready as we'll ever be, I guess. I'll explain why in a little bit. Shabbat Shalom from Under the Dome. As I was just saying a few minutes earlier, I hope everyone had a really good Sabbath or Shabbat today. And, uh, you know, restful in Yahusha and uh, getting ready for the gunshot sprints of the next week. Now, I don't usually talk about my marriage too much. I've, I've, I've spoken less and less about it in, in recent years. But I am excited because this week my wife and I are celebrating 20 years of holy matrimony. And... I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about this just a little bit because I I feel so blessed by Yah that he has put this amazing woman in my life. We're high school sweethearts. I mean, we knew each other since we were babies. I mean, she was she was 15, I was 16. We were just little kids. Uh I, excuse me, children. We were children pretty much. And it's amazing that we are just of such like mind that we are in agreement on everything. I mean, just like all the stuff I research and I talk to you guys about, and we just sit down and we go through it together. And so it's been really amazing. And, you know, funny is that, or maybe not so funny, I, I've been talking the last year about how we're getting a divorce. Well, my wife had to correct me today. We're not getting a divorce. We are rescinding our marriage. There's a big difference between getting a divorce and rescinding our marriage. I don't know if this is a midlife crisis thing. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, so, uh, and I think we're going to be doing it in the next two or three years, basically telling the government to shove it and where they can shove it. And we will be telling people, we, uh, if people are asked if we're divorced, we like, no, we've, we're rescinded. And what, there's a point to this. Uh, we're coming up on the Passover season and we were just talking as a group. Everyone is, you know, different calendars. And so maybe a little week or two weeks off here and we're all kind of celebrating Passover a different time, but. For those of you who will be attending Passover in Missouri, um, if you guys know about Adam Fink and Parable of the Vineyard, uh, we will be there that week. And I think there's some people in the room that will be there. Well, my wife and I will be getting married. After 20 years, we're finally we're going to commit and get married. And uh, we will be, it's not going to be a big event. We're actually going to have Adam Fink do it. Adam Fink is going to marry us, I think. And we're going to be doing it in our trailer, so don't ex we're not romantic, so don't expect you know roses and and uh, a reception. We, we will invite a few witnesses in to. <laughs> so if anyone is there, you know you can come in. They will kick you out as soon as we have said our vows, and uh, please don't come back for like another hour. Um, all that to say, well, let's, we are on. What are we on this week? I think we're on Revelation seven, seventeen and eighteen. Hebrew Revelation 17 and 18. We are going to get started. Do I have any volunteers to pray? Any volunteers? Anytime. Okay, Rob, you get to pray again. Yes. Father, we thank you for this time that we have here, gathering together to review your words. Father, may you reveal uh, what the Spirit desires to reveal to us. And may we discuss these, these topics. Um, Father, we humbly want to discuss them and approach this with humility. Father, we, we know not these, these revelations. We only are here to discuss them and share and show what what we see currently and how and what it may develop into by the discussions. Father, may your spirit lead us in these discussions and may we better understand your words and what uh, is being stated here by the taught one, uh, Jokinen, of what he writes. May you bless each and every person here listening and may each and every one uh, be blessed by it. Wow. In Yeshua's name, I pray. Hallelujah. All right, Rob, do you want to go ahead and kick it off? I will. I will be reading from the Confidential Councils 
the Hebrew Revelation chapter 17. Then one of the seven messengers who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me and said, Come, and you will be shown the judgment of the great harlot who sits over much waters, with whom the kings of the earth and those whom she had made drunk with her wine have committed adultery. So he brought me into the wilderness, and I saw the woman who sat on the animal whose appearance was like the appearance of lilies, and was full of names of blasphemy, and he had seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed with red garments, with the appearance of lilies, and upon her there was much gold and goodly stones and pearls, and there was a golden cup in her hand full of uncleanness. And on her forehead was written the name of the secret of the great city Bavel, and the mother, sorry, the mother of harlots and uncleanness of the earth. And I saw that the woman drank of the blood of the set apart ones and of the blood of the testimony of Yeshua. And I had a great amazement when I saw her. Then the messenger said to me, because of what do you have amazement? I want to tell you the secret of the woman and of the animal that she sits upon, and because of what he has seven heads and ten horns. The animal which you saw was, but is not, and will come again from the deep, but he will go to Sheol. Then the men of the earth will be amazed by, about him when they see the animal who was and is not, although he is. And here is a word which needs insight and wisdom and understanding. The seven heads are seven mountains, which the woman sits upon, and these are seven kings. And of them, five are fallen, another is, but the second is not yet. And when he comes, he must for he must be for a little time. And the animal which was and is not, this is the eighth, and he is of the seven, and goes to Sheol. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have not yet received the kingdom, but they will rule like kings with the animal for a little time. And they have one plan, and they will give the power and their strength to the animal. And they will make war with the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them. For he is the Adon of Adonim, and the king of kings. And with him are the chosen ones and the faithful ones. And he said to me, the waters which you saw, which the harlot sits over, are peoples and crowds and nations and the ten horns which you saw on the animal they will be haters of the harlot and they will make desol a desolation of her and will eat her flesh and with fire they will burn her for yahweh gave it in his in their heart to do this sorry for yahweh gave it in their heart to do his will by giving her riches to the animal until the word of Yahweh is completed. And the woman which you saw is the great city, which reigns over all the kings of the earth. And that is the end of chapter 17. I will hand it over to Michael to begin our discussions. Michael? All righty. Uh, Shabbat shalom, everyone. Uh... It's an honor to be here. Um, I will start my commentary on uh, Revelation chapter 17. Um, I've been, I, I noticed a trend during this chapter, that, and I'm going to summarize it with 1 Corinthians 6.16. I, I thought this would be great. Uh, Do you not know that he who unites himself with the prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. And I, I, I want to read... Um, I guess you would call it two commentaries on it, but I thought it did a great job. Um, Augustine of Hippo, um, he wrote a book called The City of God, which is early 5th century, stated that Babylon and Jerusalem referred to two spiritual 
cities were spiritually at war with one another throughout all of history. So Babylon from Babel is inter interpreted as confusion, Jerusalem's vision of peace. So they are mingled, and from the very beginning of mankind, mingled, they run on into unto the end of the world. Two loves make up these cities. Love of Yah makes up Jerusalem. Love of the world makes Babylon. And it's, there's always an intertwining. And this next thing kind of goes way more into detail. So I'm probably going to butcher this uh, Hebrew word, but it's sha'anat, and it basically means illicit mixtures. So in the, you know, in the Tanakh, there's a law that says wool and linen must not be woven together to form a cloth, other than that for specific exceptions. So that same law principle also speaks of not sowing seeds of two different kinds next to one another in a field. So these both fall within the principle of sha'anat. So this woman seated on the beast, and as Rob read, wearing purple and scarlet, is wearing a blatantly rebellious illicit mixture. It says, while that she may consider herself to be a royalty, um, she is equally an unclean prostitute, Scarlet. Yet the symbolism of what she is wearing goes on further. She is said to have adorned herself with gold and precious stones. I think because the entire theme of the woman and the beast is to mimic and mock Yah, then the gold and precious stones is kind of a diverse, perverse display of the breastplate that the high priest wore. So the high priest wore precious stones, symbolizing Yah's chosen people, the 12 tribes. The harlot riding the beast wears her breastplate of precious stones, possibly symbolizing the vulgarity and decadence of Satan's chosen people, which would be the Gentile nations. Um, so I thought that was kind of a good way of summarizing, I, I thought, uh, this chapter. Um, I only have a few in this chapter. I will split it up um, and then hand it off to Noel. Uh, number two. Let's read. It says, With whom the kings of the earth, those whom she had made drunk with her wine, have committed adultery. So this is a excellent cross-reference in Jeremiah 51.7. Babylon has, has been a golden cup in the hand of Yah, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk her wine, therefore the nations are going insane. Um, and I'm going to read 3 and 4 now. So I think I want to read... Yeah, let me read uh, the Greek and the Hebrew. So, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon the scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And in the Hebrew it says, So he brought me into the wilderness, and I saw the woman who sat on the animal, whose appearance was like the appearance of lilies and was full of the names of blasphemy, and he had seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed with red garments with the appearance of lilies. And upon her there was much gold and goodly stones and pearls, and there was a golden cup in her hand full of uncleanness. Um, lots of differences. I just want to focus real quick on um, the filthiness of her fornication in the Greek, and then the filthiness of her uncleanness. I would say, you know, that's kind of different. Yes, yes, fornication is unclean, but I don't know. I thought that was uh, interesting that the Hebrew said that. And then it also, garment appearance of lilies. So if you, you know, Google the appearance of lilies, you know, it's kind of a, I guess, uh, what, would be, what would it be? A uh, purple color. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about uh, is on number four, the word abomination in the Greek. So it's Strong's 94, 946, and I'm going to butcher this name too. Bedegolama, <laughs> uh, B-D-E-L-U-G-M-A, and it's basically, the definition is a detestable thing, an abominable thing, and a cursed thing. Um, you know, I love word studies. It's used six times in the New Testament, two in Revelation 17, four and five, actually, one in Revelation 21. It's also, so that's, that's three times. Uh, Matthew and Mark talk about Daniel's abomination of desolation. That's five, that's the fifth time. And then the, the last time, and I thought this was interesting, it's in Luke, Luke 16, 14. So it says, now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were ridiculing him, Yeshua. And he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of people. But Yah knows your hearts, because that which is highly esteemed among people is detestable or an abomination in the sight of Yah. I thought that was interesting. Um... You know, in Revelation, we always take it literally. Uh, Dan Matthew and Mark talk about the abomination of desolation. You know, a lot of people take that literally too. But in Luke, it doesn't. Luke says it's a heart issue. And being highly esteemed among people is, a, is an abomination or detestable in the sight of Yah. 
I'm going to split it up there. I have a little bit more. I have a lot more on the next chapter, but I'll hand it off to Noel. Well, I have a confession to make. Uh, my dog did not eat my homework, but it's something close to it. It's kind of funny because we just came from Hebrew 101 class and Rodney assigned us homework mm -hmm. in that class. Or I, I told her, I, I feel like I need to call Professor Ronit now. Uh, but I, because we attempted to do this chapter last week, if you guys recall, we were going to do 16 and 17, but 16 took two hours. I had all my study notes on it. And apparently, because I cleaned out my office yesterday, I threw them away. And right as we were getting ready for the Hebrew class, I'm frantically looking for them. I'm like, no, I, like they're gone. So, so I'm kind of going, uh, I'll be shooting from the hip here based on trying to remember what I did study. So you guys will have to bear with me. So there's a, there's a few things to, to, to note here. One is that, and Michael had just talked about this. Well, let me just, let me just comment on here first that the horror of Babylon. I think I had mentioned last last week that it really came to my uh it, it was it was um I don't know what the word I'm looking for here but it it was sobering it was sobering really to come to terms with the fact that this is Jerusalem being described here in fact I can't see it any other way now and one of the ways I often when we started this study, you could probably refer back to several videos and people asked about the whore of Babylon. And I said, well, you know, because I always see the whore of Babylon as the, the, the mystery religions. The mystery religions is often depicted as a, as a woman. And you see, you know, a lot of, you know, women priests and so on, very sexual and so on and so forth. I, I was thinking this is, you know, the, the Babylonian mysteries, the whore of Babylon. And there, there are definitely, undoubtedly in my mind, that, that's, a, I haven't taken that meaning away. Like there was probably the mysteries involved in the Talmudic oral traditions and all, all sorts of things. But it, it's very clear here that this, this whore is referring to Yehuda. And I say that, you know, uh, very, very sober as I say that. And we can see some clear connections with the theme. I don't know why I never put this together beforehand, but we can see where uh, Israel was a wife and she became a whore. And this this is one of the whole themes of the Bible. In fact, this theme is what what led me to Torah. When I was doing a study on on I was like, what? There's two houses? Because I thought they were all Jews. And I'm like, what? There's the house of Israel and the history, house of Israel was divorced. What? And I did that study and it was really exciting me. And then it led me to to uh Torah. So let me just I'll go ahead. I don't know what Bible bot is going to look like. This comes from Isaiah 54, verses 5 through 8. I'm going to go ahead and type it in, though, anyway. It's just to be official. 4, 5 through 8. So here's what we, we see here. For you, for your maker is your husband. Now, the context here is the, I, I believe the context here is the house of Israel. Uh, of course, of course, uh, Isaiah, or Yesh, Yeshia, Yeshayahu was, his ministry was specifically to Yehuda and the kings there, but follow with me here. For your maker is your husband, uh, Yahuwah of hosts, or I guess Yahuwah Sevaoth is his name, and the set apart one of Yeshurel is your redeemer. He is called the Elohim of all the earth. For Yahuwah has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in, in Ruach, like a wife of youth when you were refused, declares your Elohim. For a little while I have forsaken you, but with great compassion I shall gather you. And this is again referring to who did Yahushua come for? He came for the lost sheep of Israel. In an overflow of wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving commitment I shall have compassion on you, says Yahuwah, your Redeemer. All right, so <clears throat> there's one other observation I want to quickly make before going into what I really want to talk about tonight. And this is something I actually saw, interestingly enough, in the uh, as I go through the Torah portions, I, I read the from the Targum. And last week I was reading on this. I, I couldn't believe it. On the week we were about to present this, I read in uh, Exodus 25, verse 31, and it's talking about how to make the candelabrum, or the specifically the menorah. And this is what Yahuwah is instructing. Now keep in mind, this is the Targum, uh, 25. Verse 31 of Exodus. And thou shalt make a candelabrum, or a menorah, of pure beets and gold shalt thou make the menorah, the candelabrum. Its base and shaft, its cups and apples and lilies shall be of the same. 
Now I did a I did a, a word search on lilies in the Masoretic and the Targum all over, and that's all I was able to pull up. So it's it is interesting here that we I don't know if this is a connection or not. I'm just throwing this out there. It's interesting that we have this adulterous woman who, according to the Hebrew text, is uh, is has the appearance of lilies, which she does not have in the Greek. And it, it I'm kind of wondering if that's like um, you know, like the appearance of the menorah, right? Kind of a spirit. She has the appearance of this spiritual reality uh, that is of Yah, but actually, no, she's pouring herself after the other nations. Now, there's one th one thing. I, this was kind of a long introduction, but there's one thing I specifically want to talk about before handing it back over to Rob, who I'm I'm sure has some amazing uh, slides tonight, uh, dripping with colors. And I say I don't say that sarcastically at all. I love Rob's slides. And so we've talked. I've talked about in the past about the the uh, the seven heads of the beast, uh, really the eight heads, and how each of these represents a different person, a different king. Well, I'm going to go with the same thing here with the woman. I kind of think that this woman may have been, you want to say, symbolic or whatever that. Uh, materialize in an actual historical woman. So I'm going to be reading to you because I lost all my notes. But this is actually better. I'm doing better. I'm reading from Wikipedia. And the daughter of Herod Agrippa, her name was Bernice. And Bernice was, um, she was kind of like the Cleopatra of her day. Um, there is some interesting, she actually has appearances in the New Testament. Let's see if I could find where they're at in here. I had them all written down. Ugh. they're all in the book of Acts. So if you can recall, I was going to pull them up, but if you can recall when, when Shaul, uh, my, my favorite sparring partner, is brought into the Herods, Bernice is there. Bernice is there next to Herod. And they're, they're having a talk. She appears like three times in the books of Acts. So Bernice of uh, Cilicia, also known as Julia Bernice, and sometimes called just Bernice, was a Jewish client queen of the Roman Empire during the second half of the first century. Bernice was a member of the Herodian dynasty that ruled the Roman province of Yehuda between 39 BC and 92 CE. She was the daughter of King Herod Agrippa I and the sister of King Herod Agrippa II. Now, what's interesting is that, well, I'll get into it. Okay, this isn't that long of an article. I'll try to read through it really quickly. I think this is really interesting. What little is known about her life and background comes mostly from the early historian Flavius Josephus. There he is again, who detailed the history of the Jewish people and wrote an account of the Jewish rebellion of 67 AD. All right, I'll, I'll skip some of this. It talks about how she's compared. Oh, during the first Jewish Roman war, she began, began a love affair. Pay attention now. She became a love affair with the one and only, the future emperor Titus. However, her Unpopularity among the Romans compelled Titus to dismiss her on his ascension as emperor in 79. All right. And then when he died two years later, she disappeared from the historical record. So in 81 AD, she disappeared. She's gone. Nobody knows what happened to her. Keep in mind, though, that their love affair began, I think, in 68 AD. So they were lovers up until 79 when he finally, like, he ditched her. He's like, okay, my, my dream of ascending to the throne has always included, you know, ditching whatever woman I'm with. So you're, you're, you're leaving. All right, moving on. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Josephus records three short-lived marriages in Bernice's life. So she, she was passed around a lot, you know, kind of like a whore. But even more, more um, interesting here is that she apparently, for a good 10 to 15 years before she went off with Titus, was in an incestuous relationship with her brother. It's well documented by multiple people. Uh, the people of that time, it like, it's kind of like we say things about like, you know, celebrities like Beyonce and Britney Spears. It was like that. Like she was like the Cleopatra Britney Spears of her day. And people knew that she was hanging out with her brother uh, a little too close and too long. Let's see what it says about the Jewish Roman Wars, where we take herself up to 70 AD. In 64, 64 AD, Emperor Nero appointed Flor, uh, Gessius Florus as procurator of the Judean province. During his administration, the Jews were systematically discriminated against in favor of the Greek population of the region. 
Tensions quickly rose to civil unrest when Florus plundered the treasury of the Temple of Jerusalem under the guise of imperial taxes. Following riots, the instigators were arrested and crucified by the Romans. Appalled at the treatment of her countrymen, Bernice traveled to Jerusalem in 66 to personally petition Florus to spare the Jews. Not only did he refuse to comply with her request, Bernice herself was nearly killed during skirmishes in the city. All right, let me let move on here. This is, I wanted to get to the part where, um, hmm. It was during this time, this is going up to 68 AD. This is when Titus is coming down to make war with Josephus in Galilee. It was during this time that Bernice met and fell in love with Titus, aw, who was 11 years her junior. The Herodians sided with the Flavians during the conflict and later in 69, the year of the four emperors, which I have talked about. When the Roman Empire saw the quick succession of the emperors Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, this is pay attention to this. This is really important. Like Bernice reportedly used all her wealth and influence to support Vespasian, the father of her lover, on his campaign to become emperor. Okay, so here you have you know this this woman who has the appearance of a Jew. She wasn't. Who, you know, uh, she she's actually. What is she doing? She's literally whoring with Rome, right? The kings of the earth. So, and I think that's enough. And it goes on and on from there and so on and so forth. But uh, I found that really interesting. So hopefully you guys did too. And back to you, Rob. All right. Thank you, Noel. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to touch on chapter 17, who the woman likely is. I'm going to also address what I found on the, the lilies, and I will also uh, discuss the, the wine that is mentioned. And then lastly, regarding the beast. Uh, so first, I wanna start with the, this judgment of the great harlot who sits over much waters. And as we read, the much waters is peoples, nations, etc. So we know it's peoples. So I dropped a slide in and here, here we go is, is the, the woman was clothed with red garments with the appearance of lilies. And upon her, there was much gold and goodly stones and pearls. And there was a golden cup in her hand full of uncleanness. And her forehead was written the name of the secret of the great city Babel the mother of the harlots and uncleanness of the earth. So we see that this, this woman, this harlot, is described as the mother of harlots. So that, that would imply that there are multiple harlots uh, throughout, the, throughout the earth besides uh, her, her being the mother and the daughters of her throughout the world. So... Uh, I wanted to mention that. And obviously she drank the blood of the Holy Ones and the, and the blood of the testimony of, of Yeshua. And the woman which you saw is the great city. Okay, so it's giving you a clue here on who this woman is. She is the great city. She's the mother of, of, of harlots, this great city, which reigns over all the kings of the earth. All right. So first I will address the lilies and then get come back to come back to her. And so here on verse four, we have the woman, which which we know is uh, the great harlot, which is the great city, and also mentions her being the mother of other cities, of other harlots, who rules over many people. And so she was clothed with red garments with the appearance of lilies. Now, the Hebrew word for lilies here, uh, when looking this up, and I consulted with uh, Ronith on this, that this word is actually the word for roses. And when I look this up in other scriptures, and I'll, I'll show you another slide, but in other scriptures is that that same word is interpreted as roses. Uh, for this word that, I mean, I'm sorry, that word is interpreted as lilies in many places, but the word or, the, yeah, the word for roses, or the word for lilies is actually roses. 
So I could I could let uh, Roni explain on that further. But so what I did is I pulled up some scriptures on lilies and tied it in. And when you look at both lily and roses, when you look up the the actual Hebrew word, you still get the same context here. And so in Hosea 14:5, I will be like the dew of dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. So there's a hint that this, this woman has an appearance, you know, garment with the appearance of lilies and the lilies representing Israel here. And then when you read in 2 Esdras 5, 20 through 27, Esd Esdras after fasting seven days, he's, he's, he's talking and he, he makes these comments that, uh, O oh Lord, that bears rule from every force of the earth and from every uh, tree, you have chosen one vine. So he's he's making all these references to Israel. Uh, of all the land of the whole world, you have chosen for yourself one lily. And of all the depths of the sea, you have filled yourself with one river. And of all the built cities, you have hollowed for yourself Zion. Of all the birds you created and named yourself one dove, one sheep, one people. Unto this people you love, you gave a law that is approved of all. So he, he's referencing Israel to uh, uh, a vine, a lily, a river, Zion, a dove, a sheep. So it, it's like uh, these are set apart because it's saying one. It's it's uh, one specific out of the rest. And then we see in a testament, uh, testament, testament of Simeon 6.2, as a rose shall my bones flourish in Israel, and as a lily, my flesh in Jacob. So whether what, whichever word you flip here, it's still referencing Israel, Jacob, or rose and or lily. And then I'm going to add to that. So if you take if you take that and look at roses, you'll see this the same thing. And I, I took the same thing with uh, Hosea, Hosea 14, 5. So that word being rose and not lily, I would be like the dew to Israel. He is a blossom like a rose, like the rose, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. And then we see in Song of Solomon, I am the lily of Sharon, the rose of the valleys, like a rose among the thorns. So is my darling among the young women. But when you look up in uh, most translations, you will it will come up as I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys, like a lily among the thorns. So is my darling among them. But the word for uh, lily is is actually rose, because if you if you just look at that second part, like a lily among thorns. Or like a rose among thorns. Well, we know roses have thorns. They're, they are they, they bud on on the stems, and the stems are full of thorns. So that kind of confirms that that word should be rose, uh, besides the word itself in in Hebrew. So I just want to point that out regarding the lilies. It may be a translation, but uh, either way, however someone wants to dice this, uh, I would say the lily and the rose still represent Israel in in second witness of of scripture so either angle i i still see this description of appearance of this red garment uh as lilies or roses that it is representative of of jerusalem or israel that city uh in, in representation of it and then i will add this to also describe this woman and I'll drop this slide in. So here in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16 is describing this prostitution, this woman that commits adultery. So we see in verse 2, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. So here Ezekiel is going to make known to Jerusalem her abominations. And he says here in verses 38 to 42, so I will judge, this is him giving Yah's judgment to them. So I will judge you, this is Jerusalem, as woman who commits adultery or shed blood, as should or shed blood are judged. And I will bring on you 
the blood of wrath and jealousy. I will also hand you over to your lovers and they will tear down your shrines, demolish your high places, strip you of your clothing, take away your jewels and will leave you naked and bare. And, we're, and, we're, and we just read all this. Uh, they will incite a crowd against you. They will stone you and cut you to pieces with their swords. They will burn your houses with fire and execute judgments against you in the sight of many women. Then I will put an end to your prostitution and you will also no longer pay your lovers. So I will satisfy my fury against you and my jealousy will leave you and I will be pacified and no longer be hanged. So I believe this, this is speaking to this woman here as we've read uh, what is happening and describing this woman tied to the, the roses or lilies uh, to her. This is uh, the great city, the, the great harlot would be tied into Jerusalem. And uh, so I wanted to uh, pose that as the description of this woman and also address the lilies. And then on my second go around, I'll address her wine and the uh, the beast. So I'll hand it over to Michael. All right, interesting stuff. I have way more in chapter 18, so I'll make the rest of mine on 17 quick. Um, I'm going to start on to number five. So, And on her forehead was written the name of the secret of the great city, Babel, the mother of the harlots and uncleanness of the earth. And I thought Hosea did a good job kind of cross-referencing it. It's uh, Hosea 2, 2. Dispute with your mother. Dispute, because she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. But she must remove her infidelity from her face and her adultery from between her breast. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and expose her as on the day she was born. I will also make her like a wilderness, make her like des desert land, and put her to death with thirst. Also, I will take no pity on her children, because they are children of infidelity, for their mother has committed prostitution. She conceived them, has acted shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and water, my wool and my flax, and my oil and my drink. Um, the next thing is uh, number six. I'm going to read the Hebrew. No, I'm going to read both. So... And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the Hebrew says, And I saw that the woman drank of the blood of the set-apart ones and of the blood of the testimony of Yeshua. And I had a great amazement when I saw her. I thought it was interesting um, that they replaced martyrs with testimony. And, I mean, it, it's correct. It's just, you know, you get a different... Uh, you think something differently on the word martyr. So... Martyr testimony, Strong's 3144, Martus, Martus, a witness, a witness, an eye or ear witness. Um, it doesn't really mean to kill yourself, right? A martyr. Um, so I wonder why they kind of distorted that word. It, it's, it's a witness. So the testimony is the correct, I think, um, translation. But uh, I just wanted to point that out, that martyr doesn't mean that. Um, and the last one, I'm going to read both on number eight. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And in the Hebrew, the animal which you saw was, but is not, and will come again from the deep, but he will go to Sheol. Then the men of the earth will be amazed about him, when they see the animal who was and is not, although he is. Okay, so I just, again, highlight, it's pretty, you know, blatant, but uh, I thought it was cool that it says, you know, and will come again from the deep, he will go to Sheol. Um, <laughs> Jose, that's funny. Um, yeah, but he will go to Sheol. I thought that was uh, very descriptive. Um, so where in the Greek it says, you know, from the bottom of the split and perdition. And the Hebrews says, come again from the deep, but he will go to Sheol. But uh, what I really wanted to focus on, and it's kind of a side tangent, but I, you know, I, I every chapter we're doing, I'm studying the interlinears and looking for, you know, kind of tidbits. And this one kind of led me to a tidbit. So number eight, it says, you know, whose names were not, which ironically is not in the Hebrew, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Um, that word foundation, katabole, laying down, foundation, depositing, sowing, deposit, and then I thought this was interesting. Technically used of the act of conception. 
conception, foundation. So First Peter one twenty, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. Uh, if you've heard our wisdom study, this is just another tool in our toolbox that uh, the word for date, foundation can is also technically used for the act of conception. Thought that was cool. I have a lot on eighteen, but I'll hand it off to Bill now for seventeen. Yeah, I've um, you know, I, I have a lot of potential notes on this chapter, but I kind of don't want to be repetitive. For those of you who have been following, you know, I did that video a couple weeks ago on the beast of I call it the beast of Revelation finally revealed, and in that I talk about my what I you know it, it's not my theory. I mean, it's it, many people throughout the history of the church have have held this officially idea of the the seven heads you know being the the seven caesars the caesars and the flavians and so on and so forth and i i think that i i talked about the commentary on the the woman which i'll be adding to to that paper uh and i appreciate that was some great i i need to take more um i need to make some more phone calls with uh ronit and uh you know beat beat rob to it each week uh <laughs> But um, it's, okay, so I didn't want to be really, really repetitive. But one thing I did like, I just wanted to call, uh, point out if you did not follow that video, if you didn't catch it yet, was this idea of the of the ten kings that it talks about in here. And you know, I could be wrong about this, but I think that there is. Oh man, I just lost it. I just had my notes in front of me. Now it's gone. Oh, here it is. Uh, Josephus. I believe comments on what may be these 10 Kings that were giving a kingdom for an hour. And he, uh, I can just go down the list here of the names real quick. Joseph, the son of uh, uh, Gorion, the governor of Jerusalem and Nanus, the high priest, uh, someone named Jesus or Yeshua, not, not the Yahushua we uh, is, who is our Messiah. Eliezer, Niger, a Yosef, a Manessa, a Yochanan, not, not, this Yochanan who wrote this book and a another Yochanan and then our very own Josephus. Uh, but interesting enough, it, it appears that Josephus was one of these 10 Kings. It's really eerie that if this is true, that Yochanan would write this prophecy about this 10 Kings. And then a lot of the information we get about this war that went down, that revelation is talking about comes from one of those 10 Kings. It's just, it's very bizarre to think about. And also uh, another interesting note is that Ananus, the high priest, as I pointed out in the study, was the, uh, according to Josephus, was the person responsible for killing Yaakov, the brother of Yahusha, Yaakov the just, and he ordered his stoning. One of the ways that it mirrors Yahusha's own death is that the he was improperly or illegally tried and by the Sanhedrin. And, and it was carried out in such a way that there was such an outcry that he was actually removed from his position of high priest because of his order to off Yaakov. So that's all. I think all I have on that, I did really like what Michael brought up about, let me pull it back up here. Uh, the, uh, the difference in the Greek and the Hebrew in verse eight, and that's one of the biggest, I think, changes we see in this chapter, is that in verse eight, this is what it says in the Greek: "The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder." And then it says that whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, maybe Michael could reiterate his point. I wasn't quite sure on it, but I think it's interesting that the this idea that those who were not written in the book from um, of life from the foundation of the world is not in the Hebrew. And my understanding of this is that, I mean, this comes across more like a predestination type of verse in the Greek. When my understanding of the book of life is that everybody is written in the book of life and that you're not going to be added to the book of life. You can only be taken away from the book of life. Hence, you're no longer alive. The book, the book of life is documenting those who are alive or will be alive. And so it's kind of interesting that to see this removed because it doesn't, if I am correct, then this makes no sense that there are only some written in the book of life, but not others. So all that to say, and that we can discuss that later on. All that to say, I'm going to hand it back over to Rob. 
Thank you, Noel. All right, uh, I'll follow up here with the uh, the harlot and her wine. I want to address her wine. What, what is what does this wine represent here? So, so in chapter two, uh, uh, sorry, verse two, uh, re regarding the the great harlot who rules over many peoples, it says, "With her, the kings of the earth." are those whom she had made drunk with her wine have, com have committed adultery. So the, the kings of the earth have committed adultery with her wine. She made them drunk with her wine. All right, so what is, what is this wine uh, that she made them drunk with uh, where they commit adultery? And also in uh, chapter 14, verse 8, we, we read... For she, back to this harlot, he silenced all the nations with the wine of her harlotry. So not only did she make them drunk with her wine, but she also silenced them with this wine. And this, this silence from the wine, as we see here, uh, we have, I tied in two verses here with Hosea 4.11 uh, and, and, and part 12. Uh, when Hosea is talking about this, this event, a uh, harlotry and wine and new wine took the heart of my people. For the Ruach of harlotry has caused them to wander, and they have gone a whoring from under their Elohim. And we, we see that here in the context, that whoring is the unfaithfulness. They 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 strayed away, they wandered away from. Elohim and from worshiping, obeying him and his ways. So this whoring is unfaithfulness, is, is wandering away from Yah's ways, and this wine took the heart of Yah's people. And then in Proverbs 23, 32 to 33, the wine of her harlotry, in the end, it bites like a snake and it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your mind will say perverse things. Talking about the wine in reference uh, when you read that, that chapter. We read this before, I think it was in, four, I think it was 14, uh, 14 chapter. And it's referencing back to the wine, what it's going to do in the end by participating in this unfaithfulness, this wandering away from Yah, this disobedience, and it silenced the peoples. So in that silence, they, they went along with what the world was doing and did not stand up for Yah, did not step, step themselves apart. They did not do what they should have done. They were silenced and they were made drunk with her wine, committing adultery, which is uh going after other gods worshiping other gods and and more or less basically leaving leaving elohim leaving yah so that's what this wine uh what i see this wine as is this un unfaithfulness and wandering away from yah and this this harlot uh is over the many peoples rules over many peoples and Did we lose Rob? Looks like it. But it was me. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. All right. Well, I think we have some technical difficulties here. So um, while we get that, uh, uh, you you guys, you know, you guys didn't see nothing. Um, Rob, you still with us? Okay. Oh, I got a question. Is there slides or something that I'm missing? Well, Rob is dropping some. Uh, slides in the general voice chat. Oh, okay. So it'd be, it wouldn't be here where we are. Whether we, we are in the voice chat room, but also the general voice chat. There, there are two rooms that are back to back. So the general voice chat with the, the, where people are typing is right above the voice chat where you're speaking to me right now. So you can inhabit both rooms at once. You could look into the general voice chat and see what people are saying. And Doug, 
right yeah. above general right above general voice chat is diaspora of yasharel and i just added you there it's um you can see the pdfs we're reading from oh okay Hebrew Revolution. Yeah, because he was saying that uh, there was PDFs, you know, slides, and I'm looking, I'm like, am I doing something wrong here? <laughs> well, I don't want to move on to the next chapter if Rob has more points, because I'm sure he does. Michael, did you have anything you wanted to touch on in this chapter? And we can go back to Rob. No, I'm done, actually. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm done, too. So <laughs> if we move on, he's going to be like, no. So yeah, he hasn't I'm going to get yet. Yeah. Should okay. we open it up? Yeah, let's just let's open this up for a few minutes. And uh, what are you guys' thoughts on this chapter? I have some thoughts. Go for it, Ronnie. Okay. So Rose in the Old Testament represented the nation of Israel. So that's why it kind of like when I realized this week that everywhere the word Rose is mentioned. Uh, it was translated into Lily. It really, you can tell that it was a trigger for me. <laughs> I don't understand it, you know. So I thought about the nursery rhyme, roses are red, violets are blue, and I am adding, and lilies are white, okay? So why would you choose to replace a rose with a lily? Especially in a chapter where he is describing her wearing red, and then he's they are translating it into lilies, even though he's saying Shoshanim, which are roses. So that's kind of an interesting thing for me, um, why all of the English translation shows a flower that is pretty insignificant in the, in the Old Testament. It's uh, um, mentioned maybe once, okay? Uh, where the other word rose is mentioned multiple times, okay, especially in Song of Songs and Psalms. So um, that was my thought about rose. And then, if you don't mind, since um, uh, we lost Rob, I would like to share, I would like to read a passage. Um, so last week, I, in support of a the, uh, the the proposition that basically John is referring to Jerusalem, I uh, I mentioned uh, Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight, and I highly recommend it for everyone to read it because literally the curious uh, part of that chapter is word by word what happened to Jerusalem, and this week I found um, another uh, chapter. Uh, in Jeremiah, and if you don't mind, I just want to read quickly the first uh, part of the chapter because it exactly um, it, it describes what John is describing would ha would happen to the harlot. So here it is, Jeremiah 19. Um, so uh, Yah is saying, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring such a, cat a catastrophe on this place, that whoever hears of it, his ears will tingle, because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place because they have burned incense in it to other gods whom neither they their their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. They have also built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Enom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. And I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of those who seek their lives. Their corpses I will give as meat for the birds of the heaven and for the beasts of the, of the earth. I will make this city desolate and a hissing. Everyone who passes by by it will be astonished and hiss because of all its plagues. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and everyone shall eat the flesh, the flesh of his friend in the siege 
and in the desperation with which their enemies and those who seek their lives shall drive them to despair. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Even so I will break this people and this city, as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet till there is no place to bury. Thus I will do to this place says the Lord, and to its inhabitants, and make this city like Tophet. And the houses of Jerusalem and, and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled like the place of Tophet, because of all the houses on whose roofs they have burned incense to all the hosts of heaven, and poured out drink offerings to other gods. Okay, so I'll, I'll finish here. But anyway, this is just like, again, it... It's it's talking about Jerusalem and and um, you know I have no doubt about it. The more I read um, John's um, account, I agree with you, Noel. Um, uh, the big city, the harlot, is Jerusalem. Hey, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, good. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. All right. So yeah, uh, I'm glad to see others are in alignment with that because that's what I was proposing here, too, in support. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you, if it's okay, I'll finish up where I left off here. Uh, I was pretty much done that last slide in that point. I, I don't know how, at what point, but the slides there, I think I, I hit on the topic, and also you guys are, are seeing that. So, so I'll follow up with the last point here, and that is going to be on the, on the beast that's mentioned. And before I do that, I want to uh, touch on verse 15. And it says here in the Greek, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And in the Hebrew, tongues is not there, but it says, And he said to me, The waters which you saw, which the harlot sits over, are peoples, and crowds, and nations. And when you are looking at the Hebrew of those words, it's peoples and the crowds and nations is uh, that word for crowd is like a brotherhood or fraternity and nationalities. So I thought that was interesting that it's peoples like brotherhoods, fraternities and nationalities that um, she sits over. So I thought that was a great tie in when you're talking about, uh, you know, the brotherhood. So that was interesting, and and then lastly, regarding uh, this this beast, I will drop in and talk about this. And and what we see here is that the beast over the over the harlot rules over the rules the beast that is over the earth, and we see that the seven heads are seven mountains. So I postulate would that could those seven mountains be continents? Or is it going to be literal mountains or hills, as many of us have, have uh, you know, learned and, and thought about? And then it mentions that these seven uh, kings are, you know, or kingdoms through through time she rules. So reading reading this about the seven the seven horns, I mean seven heads, uh, mentions that they are seven kings. And this this could be also be kingdoms of rulership, and so I propose that this could be something of seven kingdoms throughout time that she is ruled throughout the time, and then there's going to be the sixth is in play as 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 Revelation is speaking here that the sixth is in play, and then the seventh and eighth must come for a little time. So it's it's proposing that the seventh and eighth will come for a little time at the writing of this uh, uh, this scroll this this writing. The eighth comes again from the deep, but he will go to Sheol. They all have one plan. So each one of these kingdoms through time have one plan. And it's ultimately to give the eighth their power and strength they held over the earth. So as these kingdoms continue throughout uh, over the ages, is that that power they retain and pass over to the next kingdom. And then it is ultimately going to be handed over to the eighth for his short time or little time. Now, these 10 horns, here's another piece. When uh, the 10 horns, which you saw, are 10 kings in verse 12, the word for 
10, uh, it says that they are 10 kings. That word for 10 kings, there's a difference between this word and then when it talks about them being um, ruling like kings. So that word for, the first word for king is actually angels. The second word is kings. They reign like kings. And the difference in that in the Hebrew is uh, malachim, malachim and melachim. So you, there's a mala and mela. And, and as we, we, we're learning on these differences, but, uh, uh, and, and you could see in the spelling there for angels and kings. So I wanted to point out that these 10 horns are actually 10 angels or fallen ones uh, who, uh, who still did not receive their kingdom. And they're going to rule like kings with the beast for a little time. And they, they, these angels that are ruling with the beast, will make war with the lamb. And uh, but they will be dis, but 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 they will be destroyed. But you will, but you see here that they, these angels that are ruling, uh, they will they will be enemies to the harlot, which we see as Jerusalem, and they will destroy her. So I just wanted to point that out with what what I gathered about this beast the heads and the horns, and what I interpreted that to be. So I am done with this chapter with what I wanted to share and, and uh, welcome anyone to share anything additional. With that, I am over, over to Michael. Yeah, I guess if there's nobody else, then I can read, but I guess we'll give you a few seconds if you want to say something on chapter 17. Well, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly. And Rob, I think that was a, uh an excellent assessment as well of the beast of the idea of a, of a kingdom still to be for a little while. And then an eighth kingdom. I, I think that's actually very, very phenomenal. Um, so yeah, I just pre uh, appreciate that you brought that up. The other thing that we kind of noticed here being Jerusalem is that this was like the center of the world, wherever you want to put it. This was like, you know, many times we say all ro roads lead to Rome, but Jerusalem was where the center, you know what I mean, of what's happening on the earth, on the earth or in the plain. And so we can see how that has shifted over time. But this makes it clear, like, it wouldn't the great city. This was, you know, the, let's just say the capital of the earth, if we could have, if there was such a thing. But yeah, no, no. I wanted to mention that um, if if we're looking at this from the time of Yochanan writing this, and he is mentioning that the sixth is, and then the seventh and eighth will be, uh, and with the destruction of Jerusalem at 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 around that seventy A.D. mark, uh, that could very well have been still the sixth in play during that time, and the seventh and eighth may will be coming for a little while down the road. Um, uh, perhaps for our time. So, well, well, right. I mean, what I was I was thinking in terms of a mud flood narrative of, I mean, if you guys recall back to like last July or June or July, I did that uh, video on the the phoenix that rises yeah. out of the ashes. And interesting to note is that a phoenix is most likely a seraphim, a a fiery uh, reptilian um, uh, uh, serpentine like creature that comes out of the ashes, according to the prophecy in, in um, actually comes from the book of the two pearls where it says that, but uh, I, that that's the first thing that came to mind that, yeah. yeah, there's a seventh and then it's thrown in the lake of fire and then boom, then an eighth comes out at the end. That's something I was thinking. And I just wanted to point out, I just dropped in this uh, little meme here that I think perfectly exemplifies this study that all of us are a part of right now. And it shows a, a, a iceberg. And it says on the top, reading the New Testament to understand Torah. And then you see, of course, everyone knows, you know, how big an iceberg is underneath that apparently sunk the Titanic, right? Uh, and it says reading Torah to understand the New Testament. And this is what I'm talking about right here, because my entire life, I've come into Revelation, you know, through, you know, these Zionists like Hal Lindsey and others who were, you know, pushing this agenda uh, and trying to explain all this. And it's like, no, if you go back and source this through the Bible, this makes so much more sense. It, it just, it's a totally 
different ball game. When you actually start to understand what the themes are in the Bible, the overarching themes and all these, uh, you know, like understanding the whore, all this, uh, boom, there it is. We know what the whore is because we just cross reference the scripture and it makes sense. It can't be anything else other than um, the the bride of Yahuwah who has committed adultery. So all that say, that's my commentary on that chapter. Anyone else who want to uh, make any comments before, yeah. before we move on? Yeah. I just wanted to say, I feel like Rob, you uh, kind of like uh, didn't emphasize it enough. I mean, in the manuscript, he's not saying kings, he's saying angels. Okay, so who are those angels? The fallen angels ruling through earthly kings? I think this is very important. Um, and I don't understand why the translators chose to put kings rather than the actual translation of the word, which is malachim, angels. I think this is very uh, important. Uh, um, I don't know. I think it's really important for us to pay attention to it. I, I wouldn't just kind of like brush it off like, okay, so, you know, it, it, he's talking about angels. Here. It feels like they're kind of disconnecting us from the spiritual nature of reality. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I'm sorry I don't emphasize it enough um, because I know most in this group here I think get this uh, for the most part, but uh, you know the listeners that consider these things, look these things up, research this out, and seek 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 what this is saying here because it's an important thing. Um, to to reveal or not reveal but to uh look into because we know that it says uh it, it, the scriptures talk about that we battle not against flesh and blood but against principalities uh from above and here it is it's it's showing that there is 10 a angels out there that will be ruling with this beast for a little while so they're behind the scenes Work, work in the system and orchestrating it uh, to do so. So, yeah. And also, Rob, I, maybe I missed it because I stepped away for a couple of minutes. Did you talk about the Chavrutot, you know, where he's basically talking about secret societies and... Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I touched on that on uh, verse 15. Uh, the waters which you saw, which the harlot sits over, are the people's the brotherhood, the fraternities, and the nationalities, yes. Yes, so that's a very unusual word uh, that he is using, chavrutot. Um, that's a very unusual word. It, it means like a very close, defined uh, group um, that can be like a fraternity or a secret society. So that's also something that got lost in the translation. So Wait, can you can you repeat that? Where is the secret society in this chapter? Because now you have my interest. Yeah. <laughs> so in uh, verse 15, let me pull the... Um, so verse 15. One moment, I'm pulling the Hebrew. Well, I'll just go ahead and read it while you read uh, yeah. the Hebrew. It says... So, in verse... Go ahead. Yeah. So he um, in English they said like peoples and nations or something like this. But really, what he is saying in Hebrew is um, nations, like secret societies, or it's chavrutot. It's like it's a very well defined group. It's a it's a small group that is like a fraternity or a secret society or a brotherhood, um, any one of those uh, uh, interpretation could mean chavruta. So he's saying nations, is those societies, and then nationalities. That's what he's actually saying in Hebrew. Mm, so just a quick question, Roni. When you see the, the whore of Babylon on her head, it, it does, um, no, I'm sorry, Mystery Babylon. It says mystery, correct, in Hebrew? Mystery? Mystery uh, Babylon. Where, in which verse? I'd have to go, I'd have to go look where it says Mystery Babylon. We might have already skipped that from the last chapter. Wow. Um, yeah. 
It says it in the next chapter, I believe. Oh, does it say in the next chapter? Okay, well, no, we'll have no, to... We'll have it's to, we'll it, have it's to. verse 5. Verse 5, chapter 17. And no, there is no mystery. Um, it says... That oh, it says the only, secret. It says uh, yeah, what was written secret. the name of the secret. Yeah, Greek um, is mystery. So on her on her forehead on her um, forehead written a name of the secret from the big city Babel, the mother of all harlots. So a, a name of a secret, basically some secret is written on her forehead. Okay. Would you would you say that would translate well to mystery in Greek? No. Okay. Thanks for disproving my theory again. I <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What did they disprove? Oh, well, well, because, you know, you were talking about, like, secret societies and stuff. And, you know, there's a word for the ancient religions that were secretive. It was the mystery religions. In fact, um, you know, some of the... Uh, well, like you have the Eleusinian mysteries, the mysteries of Isis, the Bacchic mysteries, the Druidic mysteries, the Babylonian mysteries, right? They're all the mysteries. And so I always found the fact that she had mystery written on her forehead um, to be very interesting, considering she's a whore and these mysteries would have whores for priests and so on and so forth. Yeah, but, uh, but what is written is secret, and those are secret societies. They have right. Well, that's why I was that's why I was trying to figure out if it, if it transferred will to mystery because that's what a mystery is. It is something that we we the profane, yeah. the uninitiated, we don't know what the mysteries are. We you know, there's a lot of things we we do know about them now, but there's a lot of things we still don't uh, that they're not yeah. divulging all the secrets. So that's why I was trying to so, you know. No, so I think I think yeah, definitely you can relate the two world. Yeah, yeah, mystery and because both of them are kind of. Secretly, we don't know what they are. They are hidden. They are hidden. Okay, the secret is hidden uh, information, and the society is also there is hidden information. So yeah, you can. And that's that. and that's why I was a little bit bummed about the lilies because I was excited about that, and you guys were like, "No, the the roses," uh, because I the idea, also, the the idea, no, uh, because. Don't we say the most high is the true mystery? There's something, what's the verse that shows us he's the mystery again? His creation is, what is, what do we say? Not the, it's got related to the supernatural, what is to come, what we don't know. So once again, I think it's again, copying the most high. Like well, with wisdom, like with grace, attributing it to evil, attributing it to something else besides once again, yeah. him. So well, no, the word the the word for a uh, mystery in Hebrew is very close to English. It's mistor, okay, or mistorin, okay. So mistorin, like mystery, okay, mistor. So in the Bible, that word is very rare. Like I think there is only one uh, one occasion where that word is used, and it it basically means like hidden. Okay. Yeah, okay. So the that's why I was, you know, you guys I I I'm going with your your rose petal explanation except I was really excited for the lilies in the connection to the menorah uh because the menorah is a representation of the tree of life among many other things and that's what the mystery religions are it's about, you know, finding the god within the the you know the the immortal soul right the immortalization process and it's the mysteries that lead them people there but it's the it's all about the tree of life and you but, know like um, no the, two the the menorah doesn't have lilies in it it has roses that's what I'm trying to tell you everywhere okay. in the Old Testament it said rose they translated to lily okay so I okay so I was feeling really down but it sounds like I had the right idea but I just uh, the translation was off. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, and, that's, and, that's, and that's why I covered both both sides, Lily and Rose, because I know when I pulled Lily from uh, uh, the Testament of Simeon and and the other one, I didn't have the Hebrew transcript to so, conform. So yeah, I, I used it as both scenarios. So like for example, like the 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 we talked about the two pillars of Freemasonry. The idea of the two pillars is that you know you have the sun and the moon, and you walk through the middle. You are the third pillar. 
And, you know, it, it's, it's supposed to lead, you know, the, the, you are the, I guess the tree of life in a way like that. That's what all these mystery religions, everybody is trying to, all religions are trying to reach for the tree of life. Uh, they're ultimately feeding off the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's kind of interesting, uh, but they yeah, are, the they're, they're, they're trying to break in, you know, the back, through the back wall, jump the fence, whatever. They're not going through the gate, which is Yahusha, right? That's the whole kind of narrative here. So it's kind of interesting. So yeah, so we see the we see the connection with the whore Babylon being like a false tree of life. You know, she had this appearance, yeah. but she wasn't. So, all right. So I'm feeling good about this. I'm feeling good about this chapter, and we are running out of time. It is nine fifteen. Um, would anyone else like to? Jump in real quick before we have Mike Michael read chapter 18. Yes, I have one quick um, thought as to why the change from Rose to Lily. Um, I think it was pretty pervasive uh, throughout history and certain sects that it's being referred to as Rome as the city. I agree, it's Jerusalem. But I think the reason they changed it to Lily is because Lily is the national flower of the Vatican City. Um, it's also the symbol for the Virgin Mary. Um, it's even the name of the uh, pits that the Roman RV dug in front of their defenses. So the lily is highly connected to Rome, and I think the translator might have been shifting the identity from Jerusalem to Rome. Yeah, that, I think you're right, Desmond. I think you're absolutely correct. In fact, the commentary, it's been a few months since I read the commentary um, on Hebrew Revelation, but when I when I... When this first came out the first week and Rob Michael and I are, are, are like, let's do a study on this. I read the, they had like 30 to 50 pages of commentary and it seemed like they were, at that time I was in agreement with them. I thought, I thought Babylon was Rome. And they talk about how this uh, prophecy of Babylon falling happens later with Rome. So I think you're absolutely correct. They were, you know, and I, I don't want to say that it was purposeful on their part, like they're trying to hide this. I think that this is one of the, the the problems that I fall into and everybody falls into. We have this bias when we read scripture and, you know, there's something right in front of our face that we can't see. I think we've all had that experience where like this curtain is pulled and we're like, oh, you know, I was seeing it very like, like I've said just now, right with Jerusalem. So anyways, um, with that, I think, I, I'm going to be the referee and call this. Michael, would you like to start reading chapter 18? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Um, okay, so Confidential Councils, Hebrew Revelation 18. And after this, I saw another messenger descending from the heavens, and he had power and great strength, and the earth shone with his light. He cried out with all his power and said, Fallen, fallen has the great city Babel, and it became a dwelling of Satan's to hide all the unclean ones of the birds and creeping things. For all of them have drunk of her wine, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And all the merchants have become rich by her great desires. Then I heard another voice from the heavens, and he said, Go out of her, my people, that they, meet, that they be not punished with her because of her iniquities. For her iniquities reach unto the heaven, and Yahweh, he will remember her. And as she did, do to her, and reward her double, two double, according to her works. And as she exalted herself, and walked after her desires, According to this, make torments for her. For she thinks in her heart, I am a queen, and I will not be a widow, and I will not see any suffering. But because of this, her sufferings will come in one day. Hunger, and she will be burned with fire. Her mighty is Ha Adon Yahweh, who will judge her. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication with her will be astonished over her when they see the smoke of the fire. And they will stand far away because of the terror. And will say, Woe, and alas, the great city, Babel, your destruction came suddenly. And the merchants will weep and hiss over you, for no one will buy merchandise from them anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and goodly stones and pearls and fine linen and all kinds of wood and all kinds of vessels of silver and iron and tin and lead. And the wine and the oil and white bread and wheat and cattle and sheep and horses and calves and souls of men. And the fruit which was to satisfy your spirit went away from you. And all the esteemed things went away from you and you will not find them anymore. And the merchants who sold these things to her will stand far away and weep over her and say, Woe, and alas, the great city of Avel, which was clothed with fine linen and with gold and with goodly stones and pearls. For in one hour, everything is laid waste, your merchandise and your mariners and your rope men, those who repair your breaches and those who trade your merchandise and all the men of your war will stand far away. 
And they will cry out when they see the smoke and say, who was like this great city? And they will cast dust on their heads, both crying out and weeping and mourning and saying, woe, woe to the great city Babel. For by her were made rich all the merchants who had ships in the sea. Through her merchandise, and now in one hour everything is laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heavens, and as set apart ones, and as prophets. For Yahweh has avenged their vengeance against her. Then one messenger took a great stone like a millstone and cast it into the sea and said, So will Baval sink and will rise up no more. And there will be no more be heard in her, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of a bridegroom, the voice of a bride, nor any craft vessel from the craft masters. And the sound of the millstones will be no more heard in you. So there's an interesting phrase in here that, you know, I've realized that I've been misquoting for a long time now. And in fact, in a lot of my, it, it doesn't really change it that much. But one of the things I talk about in my writings a lot is, you know, get out of Babylon. We all talk about that, especially when we come into the Camp Torah, we're like, we're, we're getting out of Babylon, right? And, you know, I guess it's all in the, the phrasing is still correct, but it's all in the context, right? Because when I think of Babylon, I think of, you know, Rome and, you know, that kind of stuff. But it's like, this is actually, um, it was another sobering chapter for me because, and, and by the way, this has changed a lot of, of, I think my research going forward. And I'll hopefully be able to explain that here. So we see in verse four, it says, then I heard another voice from the heavens and he said, go, go out of her, my people, that they be not punished with her because of her iniquities. And this is where, you know, where we get the famous line, come out of her, my people. By the way, just a note, I, I do believe, I do believe just based on cross-referencing with um, the uh, uh, Oh, to Solomon. The Odes of Solomon, that this is actually the Ruach Kakadesh here. The, the voice coming out of heaven is the Ruach Kakadesh. So here's the, here's the interesting thing here about this misquote is that if this is Jerusalem and this voice is saying, Get out of her, my people. And then we read a little bit further down that, uh, see, what does it say? That Oh, where does it say that it's going to be a place of devils? I have my notes in front of me here, and I thought I, I wrote it down. Uh, I will find it, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Where it a? Uh... I know it's in here, guys. Help me out. Whatever. I'll find it. I'll get back to it. But this idea that Jerusalem would be a wasteland full of devils and you know demons and spirits and that kind of stuff, like. It, it's not to be inhabited. And um, that, that really struck me. I'm like, well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, first of all, um, what, you know, <laughs> it means we shouldn't be in Jerusalem, guys. Like, like people shouldn't be fighting over it. People shouldn't be warring over it. People should not be inhabiting it. And I'll just go there with the mud flood. Like, I, I'm starting to really come back to the fact now that um, the land of Israel or the nation of Israel is the historical Yasharel kingdom of Yehuda. And that the reason it, after the mud flood that we see people digging it out of the mud and it's all wasteland is because nobody was inhabiting it during that time. And this is changing everything for me now. Uh, like he was, he was done. He was done with Jerusalem. I'm done with this place. And we see it right here where uh, in verse seven, this is a very, again, I, I keep using that word sobering. But but it says here where the horror is saying, I am a queen and I will not be a widow. And I already quoted in the last chapter, I don't need to do it again, Isaiah 54. But what did the what did the Yahudim do? And and Ronita is uh responsible for that bombshell back in our in our Hebrew gospel of Yochanan series, is that the Yahudim they murdered the groom, they murdered their husband. Uh, and here they're telling themselves, oh, I'm not going to be a widow, but they're a widow. And um, and so, yeah, this this whole thing is, um, again, uh, yeah, just really uh, reflecting on this and um, trying to take it all in and, and what it all means. And uh, at what point is there ever a point that uh, Jerusalem will be the historical Jerusalem will be populated again by 
uh, yeah, who is commissioned. I mean, we're according to this, it doesn't appear so. And this is the, the whole thing. And when we read through the Bible about this idea of this promised land and that he's going to lead his people there and they're going to inhabit it. And if, you know, they, they, they can choose the blessing or the curse. If they choose to be obedient to him, then they will receive the blessing. But if they choose to disobey and break his law, they will choose the curse. And it, they chose the curse. And this is what happened. This is how the Bible ends, guys. It ends with the, the promised land uh, being annihilated, destroyed by the Most High, by Yahusha, his son, and being like, we're not inhabiting that. We're done. So that's the way I'm reading this. Um, anyways, <laughs> back to you, Rob. All right, thank you. All right, I'm. I got three slides on this one. I want to want to discuss and uh, regarding uh, what we just read on seventeen. It, it's going to tie into eighteen here, and with the first part of eighteen, we have uh, uh, an angel stating, "Fallen, fallen has the great city Babel, and it." It became a dwelling place of Satan's, and this is verse two, and I know that was the verse you were looking for, and no, I dropped it in there. Uh, and I know the Greek, or at least the KJV says de devils, and here it's saying Satan's, which are his uh, adversaries. So it became a dwelling of adversaries and to hide all the unclean ones of birds and creeping things, for all of them have drunk of her wine, and we talked about that being the unfaithfulness and uh, wandering away from Yah. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And uh, uh, I need to change the highlighting on that. But that those kings of the earth was the angels that uh, have committed fornication with her. And all the merchants have become rich by her great desires. So if this event where Babel, Babel is, is falling, it says... And it became a dwelling of, of, of adversaries. So whether this is written in the tense that uh, it's fallen, it's destroyed, and then it becomes this dwelling place of Satan's uh, until this time we are in now. And then we see here an angel giving a warning, go out of her, my people. So once again, we're reading where Yah gives his people this opportunity to get out before there's a judgment coming upon uh, this city. So they have an opportunity to escape it, that they will not be punished with her because of her iniquities. So he's, he's more or less stating that his people need to get out of these cities. They're no longer, no more witnessing needed, no more, you know, being the light there, get out, judgment's coming for her iniquities, reach unto the heavens, and Yahweh, Yahweh uh, he will remember it, and as she did uh, do to her, and a reward double to double according to her works, and as she exalted herself and walked after her desires. Once again, that's, that's another indicator, an example, going after her own desires and disobedience and not after Yah and Yah's way. Uh, so torments will come. Uh, but because of their sufferings will come in one day, the death and the sufferings and the hunger, and she will be burned with fire, for mighty is Ha'adon Yahweh who will judge her. So we see this angel giving that warning for any light to get out of the city before that judgment comes. So then in, next we see that this harlot, uh, or, the, or should I say this, the angel, this angel saying, get out of her, my people, Okay, we see that in verse four. And then further, there's an angel that took a great stone like a millstone and cast it into the sea and said, so will Babel stink and will rise no more. So here we see this imagery that it is, it is going to sink and no longer come back up. And we see in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. It has not come back. And there will be no more be heard in her because the, the one angel gave the warning for everyone to get out uh, of Yah's people. And those who were obedient, they left. So them leaving, there is no longer to be in her. 
the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, hence they all left, the voice of a bride, nor any uh, craft vessel from the craft masters. Also, the sound of millstones will no longer be heard in you neither, because obviously she is being destroyed. No more uh, production. Neither will the light uh, of a light source shine in you. It's been totally annihilated, destroyed, and reduced to rubble. For your merchants were princes over the earth. So here it's giving us an indicator that the merchants, when described in these verses, they are the princes over the earth. And obviously we see the kings of the earth were, were mentioned as these an, uh, angels for the short time. Uh, and these merchants are the princes. Those are the ones who are making merchandise of uh, the materials and the people of this, of this earth. And for by your sorceries, all nations were deceived. And we know sorceries is that pharmakia. So once again, we're seeing this playing out now, this pharmakia. All nations were deceived. So the merchants and the princes over the earth, and here we are with the, the pharmakia, all nations being deceived. And that is reminiscent of what we see now. And in her was found the blood of the set-apart ones and the prophets. And of all those who were killed on the earth. So I think it's uh, very telling of what this is speaking to uh, um, currently. And lastly, I wanted to add that the kings of the earth, of the earth once again, uh, these angels that are that will be ruling for a short time, they commit fornication with the harlot and will be astonished over her destruction. Uh, and will stand far off. The merchants, the princes, you know, as we just read, these merchants, the princes will weep and hiss over you for no one will buy merchandise from them anymore. And what was the merchandise that they're so upset about that no one's going to buy from them because uh, Babel was destroyed? Well, that was gold, silver, goodly stones, pearls, fine linen, wood, vessels of silver, iron, tin, lead, wine, oil, white bread, uh, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, calves, and souls of men. I thought that was really key, that souls of men are merchandise to the merchants, the princes of this earth. And I think that is disgustingly sad to read that and for people to put this together, that, soul, that people, people are merchandise to them. And so we see that they are, uh, these merchants are just upset, obviously, for it has disrupted their, their system. And we see even now that this system being in, in, in play. Uh, so I wanted to uh, share that with what I dug up out of this and add that to the discussion points. With that, I will pass it over to Michael. All righty. I got some good stuff, I think, hopefully. Um, so now that we've read both chapters, you know, I want to talk about both Babylons. And in my opinion, there's a Babylon, and maybe you guys will disagree, but there's a Babylon in 17 and there's a Babylon in 18. So both are under the rule of the Antichrist. They both have ruling queens. Both are filled with blasphemy. Both hate the saints and shed their blood. Both are associates with kings and fornication, and both are under judgment and destroyed. But I want to talk about some differences. And um, obvious, the name is different. So in 17, it's Mystery Babylon. In 18, it's the Great Babylon, Babylon the Great. Um, in 17, the symbol is a harlot woman. In 18, the symbol is a great city. In 17, it's identified, well, this might be, you might disagree with this, but it's identified with Rome, inland. It's inland. And then in Revelation 18, it's identified with a port city. Um, 17, woman, whore, and mother. In 18, it's habitation, great city, and marketplace. Uh, 17, it's guilty, religious abominations. In 18, it's guilty, greed, and self-indulgence. 17, destroyed by a political power that previously supported her. And in 18, destroyed by a sudden act of Yah. What do you guys make of this? Two events, or am I being too picky? And it's the same Babylon. I just wanted to point that out, that you know there are some differences. Um, Okay, so also throughout my studies on Revelation 18, I've, I've, I was always pulled back to Ezekiel 27, the, the King of Tyre chapter. So I want to 
talk about more similarities between these two cities. So, so everybody remembers, you know, the King of Tyre chapter where it's, you know, everybody equates him to Satan later on. But I think it's Desmond who pointed out that, he, you know, he doesn't believe that he thinks it's earlier on. Um, earlier on, it says somebody else. But um, so they both talked about merchants and merchandise. They both talk about kings of the earth. Both talked about mariners, sailors, and seafarers. Both talked about many different people. Um, it, okay. Uh, both talked about destruction in the sea. Both talked about mariners, sailors, and merchants wailing. Both talked about kings being afraid at her destruction. Both talked about being exalted and then destroyed. And finally, both talked about being found no more. There's a. Uh, hopefully, this gets Noel going, and he'll research this more and. Uh, See if you can find more on that, but I just wanted to point out the King of Tyre chapter in Ezekiel 27 and Revelation 18. Okay, so I still have a lot more. I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna talk a little bit more and then I'll split it up. But um read the Hebrew on number two. So it says, And he cried out with all his power, and said, Fallen, fallen, has the great city Babel, and it became a dwelling of Satan's, and to hide all the unclean ones of the birds and creeping things. So cross-reference would be Isaiah 13. 19 and 20, in Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God, or Yah, overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. They will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. Nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will shepherds allow their flocks to lie down there. Um, the next thing, uh, number three, I'm going to read the Greek this time. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich, through the abundance of her delicacies. Um, so word study time. Um, so the word merchant in number three is strong 1713 and poros, E-M-P-O-R-O-S. Uh, definition, a passenger on a shipboard, a merchant, a merchant trader, one on a journey. So that word is used five times in the New Testament, four in this chapter. The only other one is used in Matthew 13, 45. So it says... And the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold everything that he had and bought it. So you're buying this. But then that word in the Greek, okay, so the, the word for bought, this led me on a, a trail here. So the word for bought is agarase, which, you know, where people get agora from. And, the way it is used is only in this Matthew verse, and it's ironically also in Revelation 18, 11, which we'll get to soon, but I want to read it. And the merchants of this earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise. So it's the tale of two buys, what they're buying. You can buy, you, you find a, a seeking fine pearls, and upon finding it, you, you went and sold everything else, and you can buy that. That will get you the kingdom of heaven. Or you can buy what the merchants are selling. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> uh, but I thought that was cool. That that word is only used five times in the New Testament, four in this chapter, and the only other one is buying that that pearl, which is the you know the allegory of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, two more, and I'll hand it off to Noel. So number four, and another voice from heaven saying, "Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye may receive not of her plagues." And the Hebrew says, "Then I heard another voice from the heavens, and he said, Go out of her, my people, that they should not be punished with her.'" because of her iniquities. So I want to point the difference. Um, in the Greek, it says that you not receive of her plagues. And in the Hebrew, it says you not be punished because of her iniquities. That's way different. Well, I guess they say sins here, partakers of her sins. Okay, so it's not totally different. But um, I want to read uh, two cross-references. Second Corinthians 16, which... And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride. Wait... I'm sorry, I copied the wrong one. But uh, hopefully somebody could put that in there in chat. Second Corinthians 6, 17 through 19. Uh, 19 and 20, sorry about that. Um, Jeremiah 51, 45. Come out of her midst, my people, and each of you save yourselves from the fierce anger of the Lord. Um, and then finally, uh, and I'll hand off to Noel, uh, number 7. Let's see. Um, I'll just read the Hebrew. And she exalted herself and walked after her desires. According to this, make torments for her. For she thinks in her heart, I am a queen and I will not be a widow. I will not see any suffering. 
I didn't read the Greek, but uh, it doesn't say walked after her desires. It said basically lived deliciously. I don't know, it makes more sense for me in the Hebrew. Um, Jude 8, 118, in the end time, there will be scoffers walking according to their own ungodly desires. I thought that was interesting. And then 2 Peter 3, 3, most importantly, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. I have a few more, but I will break it up here and hand it off to Noel. So I found this to be a really fun little uh, uh, flat earth verse. And I never picked up on it until now. Now, of course, I, I recognize that I am, whether I'm reading from the Greek or the Hebrew, both are what we call targums. They are translations. So, you know, this is an error we we come into because I cannot read Hebrew. But I'll just read what I read in the English targum here. It says, and after this, I saw another messenger. Oh, oh take, let's go back. This is verse one, just for reference. And after this, I saw another messenger descending from the heavens. And he had power and great strength. And pay attention to this here. And the earth shone with his light. I was like, that's kind of cool. Um, it takes me back to Genesis 1 and the, the light that filled the whole earth before the sun was created. And keep in mind here that the earth, now it doesn't say that the whole earth at one time was filled with his light. So I guess I guess I take that back. Maybe this does work in the Copernican universe as well. Uh, <laughs> I have wishful thinking on this one, but it, it's kind of interesting. So whoever this angel is, I don't know. I'll, I'll be interested to think what uh, to what you guys think of this messenger that has that is descending from heaven and he has such power and great strength that the earth shone with his light. That's a pretty cool thought. <clears throat> a couple more observations here. Uh, another, and I've, I've brought this up in this study, but we see in Revelation chapter nine, and it says, and the kings of the earth who committed fornication with her, the, the whore of Babylon, will be astonished over her. When they see the smoke of the fire, and um, and so I, I think of the same thing we see in. Let me just put in here Genesis chapter nineteen. I have quoted from this a lot. This is where we see uh, Abraham. He wakes up first thing in the morning after trying to barter for the lives of the people of Sodom with the with the angel, and he he wakes up first thing in the morning and he runs. With the, with the sunrise to go see Sodom. And it says, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he looked and saw the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of the furnace. And clearly here, Yochanan Yo is giving the same picture. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed and the, the, the smoke of their torment was rising and he could look off and you, you can almost, you can envision that in your mind, you know, standing on this mountain looking and seeing that smoke rise and realizing that all those souls there, that they're gone. They're just, they're extinguished. And it's the same thing here, the picture of all the, the people that partook with this whore and the kings, and they're going and looking and seeing the smoke rising. Um, there's one, a couple more I want to talk about. Um, and I do want to point out, Michael, that that was a really awesome uh, cross-reference to the King of Tyre. I hadn't thought of that, and that just sparked some stuff. And it's like, especially considering what observation Ronit had, about the the ten kings being actually ten angels, and you know when we ask the question, are these are these angels uh, ruling over these kings? Are they you know kingdoms, or is it is it you know are there men and angels involved? And the reason why the king of Tyre I find so fascinating here is because and and Rob had already no Michael had already pointed out the uh, the connection of trade and so on and so forth that this is something that brought about the, the end of the King of Tyre. I know Rob has talked about that a lot. And, and so who is Yahusha um, calling the, this, uh, these people of the Whore of Babylon in the Gospel of Yochani? He's calling them the sons of Hasatan. And so you can almost see that if there's these angels ruling over cities and so on and so forth, and we talked about where the seat of Satan is and stuff, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's something very similar here. Um, that there is, a, I, I think of like a, a, a cherubim or a seraphim or a specific angel that is ruling over Jerusalem that is, is committing these sins of trade and so on and so forth. And that leads me into my next point. I'm going to talk from a couple uh, books on history here. This one comes from 
the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, or we'd say Yahusha the, the um, Yahusha Hamashiach. Uh, this is from Alfred Edersh- Edersheim, and this is what he says. And he's talking about the city of Jerusalem at the time of its destruction. In the streets and lanes of Jerusalem, everything might be purchased, the production of Palestine or imported from foreign lands, nay, the rarest parts, exquisitely shaped, curiously designed in jeweled cups, rings, and other workmanship of precious metals, glass, silks, fine linen, woolen stuffs, purple and costly hangings, essences, ointments, and perfumes as precious as gold, articles of food and drink from foreign lands. In short, what India, Persia, Arabia, Media, Egypt, Italy, Greece, and even far-off lands of the Gentiles yielded might be had in these bazaars. Ancient Jewish writings enable us to identify no fewer than 118 different articles of import from foreign lands, covering more than even modern luxury has devised. That's pretty crazy. And so remember now, uh, what was Yahusha anointed with before he died was was nard. And where does nard come from? It comes from India. Where was that purchased? Probably in the streets of Jerusalem. She probably went out and purchased it there in one of the bazaars. So uh, this is, you know, going here with the very exotic stuff. Just just more um, assurance that this is Jerusalem being described here. And then we see here in what Rob had talked about, the souls of men. And it is a disgusting thought. And now in the Greek, it says slaves. In the Hebrew, it says souls of men. I'm not going to, you know, argue either or. I mean, it's all the same, really, right? Souls of men, slaves. But here's a here's a quote I found on this. And this comes from um, the author Don Preston. And this is what he says. Let's see. In his book. Well, he, he quotes from a lot in here, like Josephus, the wars and all this stuff. But here's the quote. The import of slaves was important. In Jerusalem, there was a stone on which slaves were displayed for auction. Hmm. You, you know, you wouldn't really get that sense reading through the Gospels. It never talks about a stone where there were slaves up for auction. Uh, but apparently there was at that time. And then he says, Applebaum... Um, Cited by Pehar, I'm not sure who Applebaum and Pehar is, but says of the slave trade in Jerusalem, one may assume that slaves played a significant part of the economy. Josephus records that when Simon ben Giora proclaimed liberty to the slaves, that sufficient numbers of them joined him, that they swelled the ranks of his army, enabling him to become a serious threat. And I think this is, yeah, so this is leading up to the war. So Leading up to this war, they actually liberated the slaves, it looks like. It was almost like a, a Spartacus um, type of ordeal. One more thing to point out is that what's missing from the – we had talked about this. I had talked about this maybe two months ago about the the purple – uh, let me read from the Greek real quick, verse 12. The bur- merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk. Now, the purple and silk we do not see in the Hebrew. And scarlet and all fine wood and all manner uh, vessels of ivory. And again, the ivory does not ex- ex- exist in the, the, the Hebrew. And, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if, if this Hebrew document is 100% um, original or not. I can't speak, obviously. I wasn't there. Uh, but even if, I want to point out that even if this purple um, and ivory did exist in the original Hebrew text, it doesn't necessarily hit us in Rome, but what it does do is it shows us that this is clearly the Roman Empire, uh, this city, when it was destroyed. Because today, what I'm saying is is that it would be Rome's influence within Jerusalem. It doesn't necessarily have to be Rome. Today, um, we do not see the trade of ivory. Ivory is outlawed all over the world. Now, people still poach elephants, but ivory came to an end almost 200 years ago. Uh, You know, you used to see. I've been in old houses where you see all sorts of ivory stuff. I mean, disgusting. I went in this, there's this one house here in Charleston. You can go tour it and they actually have a, a stool you can sit on. It's an actual real elephant uh, uh, leg. It's really disgusting. It's got the toes and everything, but you know, they used to just butcher these elephants and they made them into everything. I did a whole presentation on all the ivory that we find in across the Roman empire. So, you know, just wanted to point those out again. They're not in the Hebrew. That's okay. No big deal. And I think that's all my commentary on this chapter. So back to you, Rob. All right. Um, 
I'm just going to uh, recap on on something that was dropped in the in the chat talking about uh, Jerusalem. Uh, if it if it being destroyed back in uh, 70 AD and it was the it was battle, then we see here that it says it will rise up no more. So if that being the case, it will rise up no more. The 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 Jerusalem, the temple, the, the entire city was wiped out uh, in regards to that, you know, the millstone being thrown and it's gone and no more voices of joy, gladness, et cetera, being heard from it. So what does, ri what does rise up? What takes its place? Well, if that being um, at the sixth kingdom, and then we see and read here that the seventh and eighth must be for a little time then we see that the seventh has risen up and taken taken uh, control and its place. And so whether you want to fit in for the seventh being secret societies, religions, Rome, you know, plug in what's going on. Anything that's going to take us away from the obedience of Yah is going to be in play. Uh, and uh, obviously being orchestrated behind the scenes by these kings of the earth. Uh, that will take, that will be given the short time uh, to reign with the beast. So I, I think that's kind of where we're at with that. And then we see the, we see them playing out scenarios where, uh, you know, the land of Israel being brought back. Uh, we see that they are back into making merchandise in the whole world. Uh, to bring control, propaganda, to uh, silence people, to uh, bring forth the sorceries, the pharmacia, and all the nations to to deceive them all. So we see all that playing out now, and I, I just wanted to bring that up and answer answer to that point. Uh, the harlot's not coming back. Uh, that's been that's been destroyed, but uh, it doesn't mean that the continuance because we see that the seven heads the seven kings and kingdoms continue in drawing people away from the uh truth and their purpose is to give the power over to the beast and throughout the ages so that's what's in play right now so i wanted to answer that question uh, that was that was posed there so uh with that i um I think I am done on additional comment, and I will pass it over to Michael. All right, I only have about four, and then we'll open it up. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read uh, number 16. So, in the Greek, it's in saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Um, actually, I'm not going to read the Hebrew, but I just want to notate that they were moved um, purple and scarlet. Um, in the Hebrew, not only in 16, but also 12. I'm going to read um, about that those colors. So the colors blue, purple, and scarlet played a prominent role in the building of the wilderness tabernacle in Exodus 26. Um, Numbers 15, it says, you know, Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And that they put on the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. Um, so you see, I thought this was interesting that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the woman that John sees in the wilderness sits on a scarlet beast and only wears purple and scarlet, while the color blue is noticeably absent. Um, and if the blue can be equated to seeds, you know, it appears possible that they are somewhat protected or don't have to go or being attacked by it. I don't know. I'm trying to equate that to that color blue and those keeping the commands. Um, yeah, so... I thought that was interesting. Number 19, I'm going to read the Hebrew. Um, let's see. And they will cast dust on their heads, both crying out and weeping and mourning and saying, Woe, woe to the great city of Babel, for by her were made rich all the merchants who had ships in the sea through her merchandise. And now in one hour, everything was laid waste. Um, so I'm going to quote just Josephus. Interesting. So according to Josephus, when Israel lost the Jewish-Roman War, I guess, 66 through 73 AD, Jerusalem was not merely taken as it had been five previous times. Instead, this was its second desolation. So, according to Wars 6 10.1, 
And thus Jerusalem taken in the second year of the reign of Vespasian, on the eighth day of the month, Gorpius, or Elul, had been taken five times before, though this was the second time of its desolation. For Shishak, the king of Egypt, and after him Antiochus, and after him Pompey, and after him Sosius, and Herod, took the city, but still preserved it. But before all these, the king of Babylon conquered it and made it desolate, 1,468 years, and six months after it was built. So I thought that was interesting, what Josephus had to say on that. Um, I don't have notes on it, but I, it, as I was reading it, I noticed all the one hours, the one hours, the one hours, the one hours. I wonder what you guys think that is. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so number 22, I'm going to read both. Let's see. And the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers, trumpeters, shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And in the Hebrew, and there will be no more be heard in her. The voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride. Nor any craft vessel will send the craft masters. And also the sound of the millstones will be no more. I mean, there was a lot of difference in this one. So voice of the harpers, voice of joy, um, voice of gladness, voice of the bridegroom and bride. That's nowhere even close in the Greek. What do you guys make of that? I, I, I don't know. I just, I did want to point out. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> I seem to bring this up every once every couple of shows, but uh, this, you know, this whole chapter was based on Babylon, the city by the sea, merchants, shipmasters, Ships, sailors, millstones, and the sea. I want to talk about, once again, the maritime law symbology and Babylon being associated with it. So I did, you know, it, you know, I'm just going to use regular terms that we all know. Citizen ship, court docket, cash flow, liquidation, commerce, deposit, bank, currency, liquid assets, loan sharks, head above water, bank balance, drowning in debt, staying afloat and your house is underwater. So I wanted to end it there by just saying Babylon is equated with the sea and maritime law. And that's who runs this, <laughs> runs the world right now. Um, that's what I got for 18, hand it off to Noel. I'm done. Rob, do you have anything else before we open it up? Um, no, I, I liked uh, what Michael shared there. That was uh, good. good, some good analogies with using the words and terms uh, related to water. Uh, I thought that was excellent. And the the only other thing that I wanted to add to what I had said last was that uh, for the seventh and eighth, and I think I think that ties right in with the what we were talking about before with the secret societies and and that eighth going to Sheol and back and that rising of the phoenix. So I just think that um, all of that is is something that's going to be taking place and. Uh, uh, it just makes it just makes sense on what we've been pulling together on that. That's all. I'm done. Let's open it up. All right, guys. All right, guys. What do you think? A couple of um, things. You go ahead, Ron. Okay. Um, I just wanted to kind of like steal the argument about uh, um, him referring to Jerusalem, the big city, as Babel. Um, so I'm going to drop a couple of things. So the first thing is that the fall of Babylon occurred at 539 BC. So we know that he's not talking about that Babylon because it's been hundreds of years gone. Okay. So what is he talking about? He's talking about um, the basically a city there is a lot of feedback. I don't know from whom. Um, okay. So basically, he's talking about a city composed of people that came back uh, from Babylon and brought with them um, a culture um, and traditions and also mystery um, or secret society or, you know, mystery uh, theology with them. So in my opinion, what happened is they came back from Babylon to build Jerusalem, but they could not shake away Babylon out of their system. And that's why John is referring to um, 
to um, Jerusalem as Babel. Now, the Bible, if you look at the prophecies in the Bible um, regarding the destruction of Babylon, uh, you will be amazed because it's, it will sound so eerily familiar to you. The same things that Yah said he will do to Babylon is basically saying here that he's going to do to the Babylonian Jerusalem. So um, here is a verse from Jeremiah. Babel was a golden cup. Remember, we just talked about a golden cup in the hand of Yahweh, making drunk all the earth. The nations drank her wine. That is the why the nations went mad. That's one verse. Uh, and then I just chose a short prophecy, but really this is just a, a, a very small uh, sample of what you will find regarding the destruction of Babylon. So these are a few verses from Jeremiah 47, and he says, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame will be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not arbitrate with a man. And you said, I shall be a lady forever, so that you did not take these things to heart, nor remember the latter end of them. Therefore hear this now, you who are given to pleasures, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day, like what John was saying. The loss of children and widow, widowhood, they shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries, for the great abundance of your enchantments. For you have trusted in your wickedness, you have said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you, um, and you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one else besides me. Therefore, evil shall come upon you. You shall not know from where it arises, and trouble shall fall upon you. You will not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon you suddenly, which you shall not know. So I just think that it sounds so eerily familiar. Um, and uh, for me, it's another confirmation that the Babylonian Jerusalem is going to get similar uh, judgment as the original Babylon. Um, and when you read the prophecies in Jeremiah and Isaiah, it, it, literally they sound eerily familiar. Excellent. Uh, just well, to, that was real quick what I the comment I put. So Philadelphia saved from the hour of trial. We were talking about an hour of destruction. Um one hour out of twenty-four hours in a day is point zero four one two two. Yeah, you know, it could be forty two months. I don't know. So. You're good, Desmond. Okay, I had a couple of things here, just things I thought might be related. Not sure though. Um, Revelation eighteen six in the Hebrew says, "And as she did do to her, and reward her double, two double according to her works." And then in Isaiah forty two, we see, "Comfort, comfort my people," says your God. Say to Jerusalem, and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So I just saw that connection of um, Jerusalem receiving double for all her sins and Revelation 18 saying that her reward is double according to her works. And then uh, I also saw a connection between Revelation 18:4 in the Hebrew and Josephus or the Jews. Um, it doesn't have the exact wording, but it's the same uh, sentiment. Uh, 18.4 says, Then I heard another voice from heavens, and he said, Go out of her, my people, that they be not punished with her because of her iniquities. And Josephus writes, Moreover, at the feast, which we call Pentecost, as the, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was, to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that, in the first place, 
they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, let us remove hence. So if that's accurate there, it does seem like uh, there was a sound from heaven, a great multitude telling them to leave. I, uh, I would like to, you know, with Josephus, he has a couple quotes like that. And I mean, I've quoted from that before, and I'm not sure if they're two separate events or one, but, you know, he also talks about the many voices below the altar uh, crying out to be released. And so I, I almost wonder if that's a, um, if it's coming from the temple if that's a like a resurrection type of um, uh, passage, I don't know. Pamela, I think Desmond was quoting from Josephus War of the Jews. The first one was from Isaiah 42. Uh, so, Mary Ann, she asked a question. I'm still a bit confused about the fall of Babylon. It seems it was done with the fall of Jerusalem, but what do we see operating us around us now? Well, I would say we see operating around us the same Babylonian, same Antichrist uh, system that is all around us, the same Roman system all around us. And specifically, though, it... What we are now, we're going to see next week because I, I was reading ahead again today, just to be clear. The rest of the world gets theirs too. All right. But this passage specifically, see, we, th this takes, this is really hard for a, a lot of us to get past this programming. I mean, even when we started this study in Revelation, I still have that programming of really wanting this, this uh, Babylon to be Rome and Roman society and all that kind of stuff. And this is how we were taught in, in training, and yet I, I, I think it's pretty clear, abundantly clear. I can't see it any other way in this text that it is addressing you who is addressing his his um you know his his bride, uh, Jerusalem, also Yehuda and Israel, right? That has gone whoring so whoring after other gods. So um just because and let me let me just say here, so we see revelation, we have been initiated into this belief and it has been pounded into us over and over and over again through bible studies our church upbringing through truther youtube videos and just goes on and on and on that this is a you know this is the new world order this is a future event it hasn't happened yet and yet you know the thing is is that revelation comes to an end and life goes on um you know it's this isn't revelation is not describing the end of the world, at least not here at, at this part. We get to the end of the world in Revelation 20 through 22. Um, hopefully that, I don't know. I mean, yeah, not everyone I, is going to agree with me, but that's that's how I see it. Yeah, I'd like to add to that is, uh, at least my view right now is that the, the harlot, the great city Babel is destroyed but it says she's the mother of harlots. And there's multiple uh, harlots out there throughout the world after her destruction. So, so the, the, the harlotry, harlotry continues. And then we also see that these kingdoms continue. Because at this time of the writing, it's, it's uh, kingdom number six. So we still have number seven and then eight at the, at the end for a short time. So we, we still have that in play, and we have the harlots that uh, are in play, and what that is, that system is in play that's going to just deceive and lead people astray from the truth by silencing them, by, the, by continuing doing what uh, the mother harlot was doing and everything that it was talking about, making merchandise of, of all the things in the world uh, with with souls of men, etc. And then I, I re remember we we read up on um, I can't remember what book it is. I don't know if any of you guys remember uh, talking about Hasatan 
And one of the things he did was uh, his fall was due to merchandise, making merchandise of things and so forth. So it's, it's totally tied in there. And then, of course, uh, the sorceries uh, of all the nations and deceiving, deceiving the world. So they continue in this whole process from then to now. It's still in play. It's just not in the same fashion fashion because obviously the great city was destroyed and now it is, is morphed into um, another another system so that's well, why we're doing it and obviously today i mean and that's a great point the she's a mother she has many daughters so the daughters have replicated they're all over the place and this is you know this is what we do see all over the world uh i have written on this multiple times about zionism and you know the their whole agenda, as well as, you know, the uh, the Jewish people who run the music industry, run Hollywood, um, you know, the Rothschilds, you just go on, you just go down the list. And, and I just want to be clear here that I am not villainizing uh, the true children of, of Yahuwah, many of which are the Yahudim, but those who are, who... Yahusha said were the, the children of Hasatan and um, are taking part of this system and of, of world control and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's still alive today. Absolutely. It doesn't just because revelation has been fulfilled in this context does not mean that evil does not exist around us. So hopefully. Right. And, and we read about Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. But yet how many other references does it uh, mention a comparison of other cities and so forth throughout in you know it is mentioned again in scriptures of comparing other cities to it so it doesn't mean that city rose up again but it's it's referring to that city being the people uh having sin like that city and here as we read that this was the mother and so it has many daughters and so they they continue so I wanted to say that in the Old Testament, the, um, the term harlot, um, except for a few cases where it refers to actual prostitutes, uh, in um, all of the other cases when it refers to a nation or a city, it always refers either to Jerusalem or to um, the the United King, the 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 Judea kingdom or Israel kingdom, always, always. It never refers to another uh, nation, nation, okay, another uh, nationality. And it makes sense because basically through their idolatry, they committed adultery, okay? That's what they did. So that's why he's referring to to the nation, to his children, to his pride nation to the to the city the great city he refers to them as harlot or um harlots you know but that's the the only time in the old testament he 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 calls that name it's always to um israel and uh jerusalem yes thanks for adding that that's that's a good point because that that should help us understand when we're doing this interpretation and and going through it to better uh solidify what that means when we're reading these when you were reading these texts any thoughts on what i shared earlier about uh the possibility of two babylons in each chapter um yeah, I wanted to comment on that is when you say two Babylons, are you talking about two Babylon systems or uh, part of the system? It just uh, changing. What do you what do you mean by that? I'm just saying there's similarities and then there's differences. And what are the differences and what does that mean? Is it is is there two Babylons or are they describing the same Babylon system two different ways? I would I would have to. Uh... I guess go through specifically those differences. I don't have a, I don't, I guess, disagree just because the beast itself, we were going to see, I think in the next chapter, probably next week, we're going to see the beast thrown into the lake of fire. So the beast is going to get it too. It, she's going to get hers. So 
um, there, there is clearly two systems at play. There is Jerusalem that is destroyed, and then the beast is going to get hers next. So, yeah. Yeah, we see multiple beasts mentioned here, and each each one of these are usually uh, kingdoms or, uh, if you will, an organization uh, of of peoples or nations and and uh, secret society, etc. So it's it, it's it's somewhat can be somewhat convoluted, but yeah, it's a system. Yeah, I per I personally don't see two Babylons. I see just one. Um, city the great city which is jerusalem and it's um ba babylonized okay um and um and the different you know the points that you just put out michael all of them are describing um that city so i i don't see two places or two systems here i see one place one system Well, um, anybody else want to throw in any observations they have before we close shop for the night? Sure, I'll toss one in. Uh, I just don't see the problem myself with there being multiple Babylons, multiple tribulations, you know, possibly even before Adam and the ancient world. Uh, there's several scriptures that allude to that. You have Israel, which is uh, Yah's chosen people being punished in 70 AD. And, you know, what was will be again. Everything repeats. So why not the same? If they were punished and they were his chosen people, why not the same things happening all over again today for the punishment of the Gentile nations also falling away and not following Yah's law? I don't. I don't see the problem. I see multiple, multiple things happening that are written that were prehistoric, that were the time for Israel, and then again happening now today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I fully... Go ahead, Rob. No. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I, I, I fully agree with you on that. Uh, we have uh, discussed this multiple times in the past where we see the same we see the same verbiage the language throughout scripture this is why we can cross reference and they always mean the same thing we can oh well, i shouldn't say always but that's over generalization but they they seem to we we see the same uh type of judgments befall throughout time and as i've pointed out if, if i were so john or yokanan he goes up to he has a vision where he goes up to heaven and he sees the throne set out he sees the court in session he sees documents being opened he sees the lamb opening them he sees worship of the throne all these different things he's seeing some things that in this context is directly referencing his generation that is my conclusion uh i think it's rob and michael's as well it's all three of our conclusion and but the point is, is that if for some reason I were had a vision where I was taken to heaven and uh, I might see the same thing unfolding, I might see the throne set out, I might see documents, I might see the lamb go up and open up a scroll. And then, you know, the, the scroll unwinds and these these things happen on the earth. And there's, there's the four horsemen, you know, the, the first one is like a false prophet, which then leads to war, then, then leads to poverty, which then leads to death. And it's a cycle. And so, yes, we see these things all throughout history. And this is though part of the 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 indoctrination that we see where people are so hell bent on revelation has to be a future event. It has not been fulfilled yet. And like, oh no, what happens if it's fulfilled? Where does that leave us? And it's guys, there's still evil out there, there's still death. Like, you know, you know, he's Yahuwah is going to fulfill his promises, he's bringing down New Jerusalem. So on and so forth. So yeah. So in that concept, whatever what you said, I do agree. We see that with the pre-creation account too. I believe that there were there were worlds before ours that were destroyed, that were judged. So uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. So yeah, I just yeah just add to that in in, in agreement that uh, I guess I guess the term or the or the what can be argued or or mistaken is the terms of Babylon and different Babylons and yeah. It's it's just a description of that system 
as throughout time it continues it whether you want to uh, say it morphs uh, modifies adjusts whatever but the system stays in play because we know that uh, the the hasatans the fallen ones they're up up and uh, pulling the strings so things get modified as each and every time there's a judgment that's being put put upon the peoples as you mentioned, there's cycles. These things happen. There's adjustments made by the enemy. The Babylonian system adjusts to change, and their indoctrination, indoctrination takes a new new um, position and, and continues on. And we just happen to be in this particular uh, time to work through the the time frame that we've been we've been dropped in. So, yeah, I'm I'm in agreement with with that. It's just understanding that um, is it a different Babylon. Yes and no. It's it's still the same system. It's just uh, a different, uh, perhaps a different uh, uh, one one in play due to the circumstances that just happened to the prior system. That's at least how I see it. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was in the book of Daniel where it talks about the uh, the explosion of knowledge and uh, people running to and fro. And we have to realize that, you know, basically with, with the knowledge that we have in our history, the world basically was the same for almost 6,000 years. And then look what happened roughly 100 years ago. I mean, the, the knowledge, it's just amazing that you have this technology that you can put in a little computer chip that wouldn't even have ran all of NASA 20 years ago, you know. I mean, it would take in a, a room the size of a, you know, a small storage building or something to compare to what we can put in a chip today. I mean, the the knowledge expansion that we have is just mind boggling. And this was prophesied in, in the book of Daniel for the last days, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but you don't know what they <laughs> what they destroyed. I mean, they've been actively destroying all technologies and um uh, all over the world and deceiving us with the timeline. So you really don't know what type of technology existed uh, even two or three hundred years ago. They are very busy destroying everything. So we we might be actually regressing rather than progressing. And that's I actually I believe that that's what is happening. Yeah, I, I want to add to that is that uh, I think in both senses you're both right. Is that the, the there was destruction of this technology and knowledge, but now we're getting this quote new knowledge of of technology, and I believe it is what they specifically want us to know and what uh, want us to have. Because if you think about this, that the the only technology that's grown. I don't want to say only, but the main technology that's grown substantially is going to be wrapped around usually the cell phone, certain technologies that have, you know, exploded. But you look at the car, 1900 whatever, uh, the car is manufactured and it's still running on, on fuel. And we know that it could be running on water. We, we, it's already been proven. But have we developed that technology? Absolutely not. They're not going to do that. They're not. They're going to control what is being released in technology for their own gain. So it is being it is being propagated out there. And while it's growing because they have an agenda, there's going to be parts and pieces of it as it grows that we can take advantage of, that we can get the truth out and so forth. And that's the part where they have to do damage control in order to get what they want to achieve. That's my input. I actually absolutely agree with Rooney and what Rob just said. Um, I, I believe we're, we've regressed in technology. Not, I mean, in the last 50 years, we might have made some leaps. But, I mean, if you look at Tesla, and I, I'm fairly convinced at this point that he was just uh, – Basically, you know, that the technology that that Tesla supposedly invented was probably Millennial Kingdom technology. And, uh, you know, that all disappeared because that that doesn't fit the agenda. It, it doesn't go well with their control of things. But I, I really believe that we are a post. I can't pronounce the word apocalypse, apocalyptical society. Um, 
where we've got dregs of technology left and we may have made advances in computers and things like that but i really think looking back at all the millennial kingdom evidence that we have definitely regressed and you know the whole horse and buggy thing may have just been an interim between great technology and the crappy stuff that we have now well, yeah, the, the technology that I speak of in particular is the electronic, computerized, put it all into a chip. And I'm not saying that's good. I think the technology that we had before was better. Uh, it was definitely cleaner. Everything about it was good. The technology that we have today is a totally different type of technology. It all depends on electronics you know, robotics, computer, everything to eliminate mankind basically from the picture and let everything run on, you know, electronics. So I, I'm not justifying that we're getting smarter because we're not. <laughs> I mean, we are getting dumbed down. It, it's the computer system, which in my opinion is just pure evil and comes straight from Satan. That technology is what I'm talking about. I, I agree with you on that too. I agree with both parties on this. And there is something about, you know, we talk about, you know, were there computers in the past? And, all, and I, you know, I believe there were, so on and so forth. Obviously, I wasn't there. I, I don't know what it, it was exactly like before Noah's flood, before the last, uh, the, the, before the kingdom reset, all that kind of stuff. Um, I wasn't there. But I, I, I do think that they're proof of the fact that super intelligent beings, you know, the watchers released is clearly here around us. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, there is, I mean, the, 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 the quantum computing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I just, I, I think that this is uh watcher technology. Absolutely. And it's, you know, going back to the timeline, if you go to like Enoch's calendar, it's interesting The it, it straight out says that the watchers are uh, released and then thrown into the frying pan uh, after the millennial kingdom. Oh, it doesn't say millennial kingdom, but after the 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 kingdom of the righteous, so that's that's where I see ourselves now. Speaking of uh, the quantum computing and computers in general, um, I've looked into it and I just don't get it. No matter how much I crack my brain, I don't re even understand how it works. And it kind of gives me the idea that it may be a spiritual thing. And when I hear that Satan fell from heaven like lightning. You know, I was wondering, maybe is there a spirit, um, what they call the ghost in the machine type thing, that the AI and all this kind of stuff is actually a well, spirit? They admit to that. They admit to that, yeah. Desmond. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they. Uh, when you listen to the guy that um, he um, started that company, I forgot the name of the company that produced the, the quantum e -way. Yeah, e -way. E -way. yeah. Yeah, so it's a black box, and they're telling you that you cannot open it, okay? So it's a black box. No one knows what's inside the box. Uh, and, um, it, and he himself is saying, he's admitting, like in a, in a speech, he's saying that um, it's like a demon or something like this. Like, they can't even explain what they are doing. So definitely there is a spirit inside that black box that is pulling stuff. Yeah, and, you know, this is my, you know, <laughs> throw us way off topic or whatever, but I just did a, a paper, I released a paper on the Mandela Effect a couple of days ago, and I'm a, I'm a true believer of the Mandela Effect. I don't know how it's happening. I don't, I don't have, you know, theories on that. I don't claim, uh, mo you know, multiple dimensions or the, what is it, the simulation theory. I'm not claiming all that, but... Clearly, the things that are happening, in my opinion, have to be coming from intelligent minds way beyond uh, mortal man that are, you know, just controlling this world right now. Desmond, what do you mean that you were trying to tie Mandela to it? Well, I was just saying when we, um, a lot of the things that we think of as Mandela, where do we go for our, our verification of what it used to be? We look in the computer. Well, I read I read a report that a guy I don't know if he was a computer expert or a, a photographer or whatever he was, but a guy wrote a whole thing about this quantum computer thing, 
and he was saying that there was hundreds if not thousands of layers of chips in there in the, the processor itself and they had to have a the, the biggest part of that box is a cooling system just to cool that thing down and he said that when he's standing beside of it that it was just like a human heartbeat that's what it sounded like he said it was just like a human heartbeat coming from that box is the only sound you heard Well, that's creepy. It pulses. Well, they documented also that they are sending computer language through this thing and they're actually getting a return it's somehow it's tied in with cern and that they are actually getting computer documentation coming back through this uh, quantum thing and they don't know where it's coming from but they're saying that that's the technology of where a lot of our technology is coming from is the return computer you know the xo or x101 whatever it is which is really also kind of a scary thing well, if we think of it as falling yeah. angel technology, it's like, let's just say Bill Gates wrote window, Windows, and you could go into it and you could be talking to Bill Gates. It's literally like this on a, re, uh, I would say, more actually realistic level that this is directly what it's tied into, that where is this, this technology is connected to these fallen ones who, who um, presented this so that you don't separate them out of it that it's still connected to them because it's about control. I, I just dropped a copy of an article from uh, The Matrix Revealed, and, and he's quoting Jordi jo Ross. Ross was the one that uh, started D-Web. Um, um, as Noel would say, he happened to be a Jew, okay? Uh, so Jordi Ross said that his D-Web quantum computers are able to summon a tsunami of demons or aliens that are the equivalent of the old ones spoken of by horror author H.P. Lovecraft. Additionally, the creator of D-Web computers says that standing next to one of these D-Web computers is like standing at the altar of an alien god. Okay, that, those are his words. I listened to one of his uh, speeches. Yeah, and he says it without a hint of any evil. <laughs> So it isn't sci-fi, it isn't Star Trek, it's straight up there the point where it what is what is it tune into what is it connected to what is this what is this not only the source code but the source of that information so we think hey you just google it and there again ai machine learning bot um is going to spit you algorithm is going to spit you back out that information but now they talk about it, you know, with the quantum quackery and with this advanced AI that somehow where is this? Um, it's literally, as they say, they're pulling the information out of the ether. And I don't mean the real ether, pulling it out of this um, black box, out of this um, black hole, but out of this realm. And it's it's not like you. it's sitting on a server somewhere. You see what I'm saying? How can it be so we're not like next to that thing, but you can access that um, frequency in a way wherever you are to Google it or to get that information. But it's really, if we think about it, it's think of the cell phone that, you know, this is already advanced tech to us who, who are a little bit older. Like, man, I still don't believe how they say these things work, that I'm talking to you and it's beaming a my voice off a satellite somehow and then beaming to another satellite and you guys are getting it live and direct. I'm like, yeah, there's something they're leaving out here and it's very spiritual in nature, but this is also how um, we're connected to this, to this world. 
Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Someone had a hot mic on. But it shows you that it's 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 almost like um, we're in that, you know, and these things show us that connection. Right. That it's like the Internet is you don't you know what I mean? You don't have to go anywhere to get on the Internet now. It's everywhere. Right. It's not like you have to go get a little transistor radio to hear the radio now. It's everywhere. Right. Now it's like you don't need to the phone. Basically, it's everywhere. They have stepped this up rapidly over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. But I don't think they've really again, they hint that the higher tech. They literally, like what Ronit just pointed, really point out where it's coming from. But again, then they, we think about our phone, our search engines, that it's somehow anything different. No, it's the same. So there is a real spiritual other yeah, part, part to this, which, again, is connected to um, this spiritual battle or this spiritual, you know, and this is where we go, well, let's bring Yah back into it, Yahuwah back into it. And his um, Ruach HaKadosh, this is why we need to, in a, in a tense, tune into them. Remember them. Give thanks and praise to them. Because this other one is always, a, as, as long as this world is still in this state, is always around us. Well, you know, another one of the things that amazes me is how many people still think that this Mark of the Beast thing is going to be like this rice-sized chip that they put in between your thumb and your skin and all that. And they have no idea about the nanotechnology that exists in the world today. That, to me, is mind-boggling. I mean, that technology is over 40 years old, that rice-sized thing, you know, that they used to inject right. into your skin. That's 40 Super years advanced. old. Yeah, I mean, we're in the nanotechnology where they can put it in like dust through an injection in a needle, and you won't even know it. Yeah, it goes. It goes yeah, back to the, the. It goes back to the magicians. You, uh, you know, yes. Watch the left hand while you know the you, the right hand's doing this other stuff. So that's what's going on. So this is where I say this is why you can see many people have already been programmed. Otherwise, they wouldn't be following lockstep. Many people in what they're doing. But the same instance, again, you see Yah's hand in all of this, that people are are not doing that, are seeing through this. But it really goes to show, like like we said, the dumbing down, the poisoning of the generations, the attack on people, to going right there where they say they have this smart te dust technology that they can put in you and get you to do what they want. No, but it's only a movie. No, they talked about this. So when we see this level, this is where I'm like, um, what does that remind us of? This ain't a futuristic Terminator down the line Skynet is going to happen. This has been this way. Like Lee or whoever was sharing, that's 40 years ago. They had already talked about this. You know, um, Rob was saying something about magicians, and you know, I, I keep having these these thoughts, and I've even had discussions with my son. He's much, you know, more up on quote technology in quote than I am. But our our conversation has been about, um, you know, what would people? The word technology is is a new word. What what would it have? Ugh, I can't talk tonight. What would it have been called in the old days? You know, like, like in the biblical days, it, it would have been called magic or sorcery. I mean, if you just take and, and substitute technology, you know, it, it it seems to work as if by magic. I mean, somebody was, I think it was Mike was talking about, you know, talking on a cell phone. It's like, ma I mean, we don't know how it works. I just speak into this little thing and you hear me all over the world. And it, it, it's crazy. It's magic. So, I mean, this technology is literally sorcery. And it, it, that's how I'm coming to view it almost, uh, you know, which leads me to ask, um, how much of this stuff should I be using? And
Lost you, Rebecca. Well, I think she was saying how much we should be using it, knowing that this what oh, they the technology, do, yeah, right. They pass Very. off as just technology when it's you know to make it seem like it's um, benign, right? right. No, it's just technology, and it's like I know it ain't. Uh, and that's what Rebecca was um, yeah, reminding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's what I was trying to say. It's, you know, it's put off as beneficial to humankind. But how benign is it really? I mean, look at all the radiation this technology emits and what we're all being subjected to in our own bodies. So, you know, I, I, I'm this is just raising more and more questions for me. Yeah, and it goes back to uh, the comment of them us being deceived by their sorcery in this in this world. And, and we see that, we see that with a lot of people, the technology has uh, consumed their time that they invest, you know, staring at their phones or, or watching the television and uh, being consumed by it. Uh, and, and so they, they, in turn, they're being silenced because they're not able to critically think and start asking questions because they can't, they don't, they won't, so. Yeah, and programmed by it, whether it's TikTok. Um, oh, yeah, that's its purpose. Absolutely. So, <laughs> a bunch of other ways right in our face. All right, Noel, did you want to wrap this up? Yeah, I think it, I think now's a good time. So, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I get you know so excited that you guys all show up and we get to have these conversations. Thank you for everyone who's contributed tonight. And of course, thank you, uh, Rob and Michael, for being a part of this with me. And we're getting really close to finishing Revelation. I think we got two weeks left uh, of Revelation, though. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about uh, what's going to happen in a couple of weeks. But anyways, um, shalom, everybody, and have a good week. Shalom, everyone. Thank you for attending and joining and listening. We appreciate it. So long. Thank you. All right. Well, for the rest of you, you can uh, let the after party begin.